This is Jocko Podcast number 400 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. With high school out of the way, I was off to the races. I quit the sneaker store, teamed up with a hustler I met along the way named Roderick, and we started selling drugs. My grandmother lived in Washington Heights, and in our younger years, Bayo and I spent many days and nights at her apartment. Having spent a lot of time in her area, I knew it was where the Dominicans had control of the vast drug market. So that's where I built relationships and brought my work. But soon, Rod and I realized that with the Dominicans controlling Washington Heights area down to the southernmost border of the Bronx, gangs running the Bronx drug trade and the Queens and Brooklyn territories too risky and unfamiliar to impose upon, we had to find a less saturated and safer place to sell. We were just a two-man operation. There was no way we were going to go to war with anyone over a corner. So we did the next best thing. We jumped on the Metro North and set up shop in upstate New York for a few days at a time. One week we'd be upstate, the next week we were back down in the city replenishing our inventory or tending to other hustles. After a while we decided to expand our operation by bringing in an old friend from the hill, Ricardo. Seven years earlier, Ricky and his family had moved to Poughkeepsie to escape the trappings of the inner city. By the time Rod and I had partnered with him, he knew the people and surrounding areas of Poughkeepsie like the back of his hand. Ricky's knowledge meant we spent less time trying to find unpoliced areas where we could sell, which in return meant less time on the streets. We were the three amigos, the rebellious three out to conquer Poughkeepsie like Bundy and Sin from the movie Belly. We watched Scarface on repeat during the day and hit the college town of New Paltz or Poughkeepsie house parties at night. We did well and the money was good, but it wasn't good enough for what I was trying to do. I had big dreams of launching a record company that rivaled Rockefeller, Bad Boy, and Murder, Inc. Not only did I want to make music, I wanted to produce and control music. So if I was going to be able to do that, I was going to need to generate a lot more money in a shorter amount of time. I needed a new hustle, and I would quickly find what I was looking for. So that right there, (laughs) that's an excerpt from the book called Transformed, which was written by Remy Adeleke. And the title of the book is Transformed, and it's quite a transformation indeed, because Remy, in the book and in his life, transformed from being Nigerian royalty to a drug dealing street hustler to a partying Navy sailor to become a SEAL, a Christian eventually, a writer, director, an author, and an actor. And it's an honor to have him with us here tonight to share his remarkable journey and his lessons learned along the way. Remy, thanks for joining hey, us, Hey, thank you, Brother Jocko. Thanks for having me on. I <laughs> appreciate you guys. Yeah, that's, this is the first time I've got to start the podcast with someone talking about selling drugs. So <laughs> <laughs> you're, you, 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 you broke the mold on that one. That's awesome. It's the first for everything. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a crazy story yeah. that you've been through. And... Yeah. Um, yeah, it's surprising that you made it. I shouldn't have. Yeah, I shouldn't have. I know that. There's plenty of, there's plenty of those decision points in your life when you when you read your story. It's if you if you think about it, if you just read the story and you go, oh yeah, well that makes sense to do. Yeah. But at the time when you're a kid, and Echo and I were talking that, about this earlier today, like when you're a kid, you don't know. Yeah. You don't see this long term. Yeah. picture you don't see you don't have strategic vision yeah sometimes you're just looking around the next corner to see what you can gonna get yeah. and you make a decision that's gonna put you in the best spot tonight yeah <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah man let's uh let's get to the book a little bit yeah. and I'll, I'll just start from there man yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll hit this book when did this book come out that came out in 2019 2019 yeah. it's, and it got picked up to be a movie uh, right before the writer's strike so oh, right on a major studio so I've turned in the first draft of the script before the strike and after the strike I'm sure I'm gonna have to do a rewrite you're gonna you know, finish kinda, it out yeah not right on, man. Yeah, man. awesome yeah. Um, <clears throat> so going to the book here my father was chief 
Adebayo. Am I saying that right? Adebayo. Adebayo. Yeah. Man, you're gonna have to correct me. It's all, all day. good. It's all good. <laughs> Adebayo. Adeleke yeah. of the Yoruba tribe. Yoruba. Yoruba tribe. Yeah. I kind of said that. Oh, okay. Yoruba. Yoruba. Yeah. It's, it's it depends on like in, in Nigeria. You know, for example, like. Adeleke in Nigeria, they say Adeleke, mm -hmm. but in America it's Adeleke. Okay. So Yoruba, uh, Yoruba, and then here some people say Yoruba. So okay, it just depends. I'll on tell you what, if, I'm, pigeon on if I'm close, can we just go with it? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good, brother. <laughs> <laughs> the Yoruba tribe. Yeah, he was the firstborn son to my grandfather, who devout in his Muslim faith. Yeah and customary to the time, had many wives. Being the firstborn son of a chief, my father was marked as special, but he lived up to his given status in early age, at an early age. Dad had an uncanny gift for memorization. Whatever was put in front of him, whether the Quran at his Islamic elementary school or a language or a common book, he would quickly memorize it. Before the age of 10, he spoke and read fluently in both English and his tribal language, Yoruba. He also spoke and wrote fluently in two other prominent Nigerian languages. The guy was a savant. My grandfather died when my father was 12. So he and my grandmother moved to the southwestern region of Nigeria to be close to her family. The move would change the trajectory of Chief's educational path. At the time, Christian missionaries permeated the southern region of Nigeria and provided free education. Muslim clerics and Islamic-centric studies were replaced with Christian missionaries, biblical studies, English literature, world history, math, and science. My father's intellectual gifts became evident as he easily recited chapters of the Bible with an encyclopedic memory and dazzled his teachers by excelling in all subjects, especially mathematics and science. In gratitude to the missionaries for the education they provided him, dad legally adopted a new first name, John. After completing the U.S. equivalent of high school, Dad received a full-ride scholarship to the University of London where he obtained his degree in civil engineering. He also earned degrees in architecture and business. When he returned to Lagos, how do I say that? Lagos. Lagos. Yeah. When he returned to Lagos after years completing his studies abroad and attaining great success in the West, he was endowed with the title of chief, a hereditary title for the descendants of Yoruba royal lineage. As the 70s approached, my father had created a vast em enterprise that operated out of the Western Western House buildings in Lagos. Wait, did I screw that up again? No, Lagos? no, that's good. No, yeah, Lagos? That's good. Lagos, yeah, yeah. Lagos. His businesses consisted of an insurance company, a civil engineering company called City Property Development Limited, and two car dealerships. His office also served as the headquarters for the World Trade Center of Nigeria, as well as the base of operations for one of his most passionate endeavors, the Lagoon Development Project. Chief wielded enormous power and wealth, not just nationally, but internationally. In the 1970s, he served on the board of the World Teleport Association in London. This feat was historic for a black man at that time. Equally, if not more historic, was the fact that he also served on the New York World Trade Center board for many years a man from the bush on a board with the elite of the elite. As one family friend would put it, Chief was never restricted by where he came from. Yeah. <sighs> so your dad, and look, I'm just gonna read highlights from the book today. Yeah. You go into some of these details, but your yeah. dad was was royalty. Yes, yes. So my grandfather, I, mean, I, I, don't, I never knew the story of my great-grandfather, mm -hmm. but my grandfather, he was the firstborn son to to his father, uh, and so he inherited the title of chief Ade Leke. So Ade means crown in Yoruba, and Leke means is supreme, and that's why we are talking offline about people trying to get that get mm -hmm. that uh, uh, that uh, dot com because yeah. it's 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 not just a name a name, but it's more of like almost like a slang for like elite of elite almost oh, in Yoruba and in Nigeria. Um, you know, kind of how here in the U.S. we'll say uh, something like uh, he's he's the Don or, you know, he's the he's the king or, you know, he's the man mm -hmm. like in Nigeria. It's like Adeleke. He's an Adeleke. OK, um, so it'd be like the king dot com. Yeah. Something well, like the, the crown is supreme. So the elite of the elite. Yeah. So um, my grandfather was that. And and then, you know, he had a lot of wives because of that. And then obviously there was some wealth that came along with that. Now, also, there is what's called the Oluoyu. And I know I'm pronouncing it wrong. So forgive me, my Nigerian brothers and sisters who, <laughs> who are listening. But the Oluoyu is considered to be the king, the king of the Yorubas. And so all of the, the Adelakes and the other royal titles 
kind of spread out from the Oluwolu. And that person, and, and it, Oluwolu passes down. And so there's an Oluwolu right now um, that, that's the king mm-hmm. of the Yorubas, the supreme king. I don't know. I can't recall his full name, but he lives in Nigeria. And so, yeah, my, my grandfather had a lot of wives. And then he had my, son, my, my dad being the firstborn son. And my dad inherited the title of chief and Adelake. And then, you know, just started. My grandfather just started kind of grooming him from there to prepare him to take over the family, so to speak. But unfortunately, when my father, grandfather was about, when my father was about eight or nine years old, my grandfather died, and uh, and when he died, he still retained the title and he still retained some of uh, uh, some of the the, the finances, um, but. For some reason, and I, and I, you know, I have to ask my older brother because he can probably explain this better. But all the wives dispersed mm-hmm. to different parts of Nigeria, and uh, but even though he came down to the south, he was still recognized as Chief Adebayo Adeleke, mm-hmm. the son of, and I, I don't even know my grandfather's full name, but mm-hmm. that's bad. And uh, and yeah, so that's kind of how it all started, so to speak. And then you're, and again, you go into this into the book, but yeah. your mom is a native New Yorker. Yeah. And yeah. so how'd that link up occur? Yeah. I tell people all the time that my mom and dad's story is a real coming to America story because <laughs> my mom, she was always into the arts, just like my dad. My dad was an art collector as well. So when he started gaining some wealth, he would buy up a lot of Yoruba art and other art from around Africa, Benin art. We had sculpt, Benin sculptures in our house as well. And, uh, and so my mom, she was an artist well and so one day my dad happened to be in New York doing business at the World Trade Center and my mom you know recognized that there was a, a an exhibit on um or Yoruba art at the Metropolitan Museum of Natural History. And so she she tells me, I didn't want to go, but something just told me to just go. And so she went that day and she was staring at a piece of art and my dad uh, happened to come alongside her and he's looking at the same piece of art and uh, he said something to her, kind of like hitting on her and mm-hmm. she was like, yeah, whatever. And then she walked away to another piece of art and then about a half an hour later, my dad just happened to be there as well. And then he started trying to mack on her some more. And he had my, my, my dad, you know, as you read, he was a savant, but he also was a man of many tongues. He spoke Fulani, which is another Yoruba tongue. He spoke Igbo. He spoke Yoruba. He spoke French. Uh, and he spoke English and a pidgin English. But he also spoke, could, 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 like a chameleon, fluctuate into a British accent because he spent a lot of time in, in the UK. And he had, like, a good ear for picking up other languages and mm-hmm. picking up other accents. And, and so... This he, stuff is really good for business. Yeah. And for picking up girls. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So he came up, went up to my mom, and he's speaking in this very suave, pretentious, uh, but not too pretentious, but suave <laughs> British accent. He's like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm Chief John Adeleke, you know, and uh, my mom's like, yeah, whatever. Because my mom's a New Yorker. She grew up in Harlem. She was born and raised in New York. She's so heard mom, this bullshit a hundred times. Yeah, I'm an African king, king type of thing. Yeah. <laughs> So my mom's like, get away from me. And uh, and so he did. And then she went to another piece of art. He followed her there. And then, you know, he continued pers- pers- pursuing her. He was funny. He was very charming as well. So that kind of won, won her over. And then they went on a date. And uh, long story short, um, they ended up getting married five months later. Mm-hmm. And uh, my dad, you know, asked my mom, would you be willing to live with me in Nigeria um, because that's that's where I'm doing my project the lagoon uh, development project and my mom said sure I'll follow you anywhere so this is a, a chunk of the book this this and it's actually a big piece of history too I was yeah. checking it out uh, yeah. doing some research about it this yeah. whole lagoon yeah. project that your dad started yeah so there's basically a lagoon um, what in Lagos? Yeah, it's right off the coast of Lagos, Ikoyi, Lagos. So kind of like how we have San Diego, San Diego, and then you have Coronado. So uh, Lagos is like the big, big city, like coastal city, mm-hmm. and then within uh, Lagos is Ikoyi. And so there was this lagoon that was off of the off of the coast of. It was actually it was a swamp. Mm-hmm. It was more than a than it was it was less than a lagoon. It was like <laughs> a swamp, and uh, and that's. Uh, you know, that's what he asked for, essentially backing up a bit. Um, there was a military coup in the 70s. My, right, be- right before the military coup, my dad bought a massive plot of land called Marico. 
and essentially what he was trying to do was he wanted to um, build a like an African Wall Street because a lot of people don't realize this, but Nigeria is so, so rich in resources. We're talking oil in abundance. We're talking natural gas. We're talking gold. We're talking cocoa. You name it. There's so many minerals in Nigeria. As a matter of fact, um, there are politicians in Nigeria who are signing deals with the Chinese government so that they could buy up uh, mines and, 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 and mine the minerals and the resources from Africa, and from not, not just Nigeria, but other parts of Africa, but Nigeria as well. And so um, because of how rich in resources Nigeria is, my dad said, hey, we need to organize this a little bit more because there's a lot of corrupt. There's always been historically a lot of corruption in Nigeria. And my dad felt as though if we can organize our business sector a lot better, then we, we can be a beacon that, for the world. Like people from all around the world can come and do business and we can generate our economy, a, a better economy in Africa. And we could create so many more jobs there was there's no there's there was and there's still no reason why Nigeria shouldn't be like Saudi Arabia or America because of how rich they are in resources and my dad recognized that and that's what he wanted to do with America where you have a lot of Nigerians um who want to get into power you know and gain wealth for self my dad wanted to get in power and gain wealth so that he can make Nigeria a better place and really get it to where he saw it could be from a potential standpoint. And so that was Marico. That's what, what was Marico. That's what Marico was supposed to be. And fast forward, the military coup happened. I think it was Abbas, uh, Abbasanjo um, who led that. I might be wrong. He ended up dying of a, of a overdose on, um, on Viagra and some other crazy stuff, drugs. A few years later, he's having a, a, a crazy sex orgy and, and died. But he uh, he carried out the military coup, and Marico was taken from my dad. And my dad bought it for eight million pounds. So you know, adjust for inflation and interest. I mean, that's that's a lot. And pounds is you know a lot more than dollars. So um, he bought it, and it was just gone, just like that. And that's you know that's the difference between. You know, Nigeria and other countries and America, you know, we could buy property, we could buy a business, we have rights, ownerships, and this, we, we're going to have it. But in Nigeria, you could buy something, spend millions of dollars, and then one day somebody could come along and say, well, that's not yours, it belongs to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so that's what happened to my dad. And after the uh, coup had subsided and democracy was reinst reinstalled, um, my dad went back to court. And, and fought them, and fought the court system, fought in the court system, and finally, because of how persistent he was, <laughs> uh, they finally gave in and said, okay, what do you want? And uh, we're not gonna give you Marico back, that's not happening, so what is it that you want? And, they, and my dad said, give me the swamp. Uh, and he laughed at him and said, Swamp, what, did, what are you going to do with a swamp? And my dad said, just give it to me because my dad was such a visionary that he felt as though if I can create something where there never was something, then no one could ever come along and say that was mine mm -hmm. and that belongs to me. And so um, that was the swamp. Yeah. That's and then as a, as a civil engineer. Yeah. He knew that that swamp could be turned into yep. something awesome. Into an island. And that's what he started, right? And he yeah. did, brought in the company to do the dredging and yep. started dredging out the, the water and filling in the land yep. and turned it into an island. Yeah, yeah. He hired Dutch engineers from the Netherlands and the Westminster Company. Um, specifically, so funny, but not funny, but interesting because I did a, a July 4th uh, post uh, this past July 4th and I kind of bullet pointed out my dad's story and uh it went like on twitter and got like four million views and like so many nigerians were commenting on that and the 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 consistent comment that i got was one it was a few one was we didn't know that you were that you were chief son <laughs> we saw you in plane and, and we saw the name at lake remy at lake but we didn't know put two and together that you achieved john at a bio son so i had that comment a lot and then the other comment that i got was the current president lied because the current president said that he discovered um, uh, banana. It's now known as Banana yeah. Island, but it was Lagoon City, and 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 he lied. So many people like, but well, they all, a lot of people saying we knew he was lying because because we all knew the history behind your father, so we knew he was lying. And that guy was the senator. The current president of Nigeria was the senator 
of Lego State. Mm. And I'm sure we'll get to it in a moment what happened, but he was the center of Lego State when what happened to my dad happened to my dad. Yeah. You know. So your dad basically dumps all his money everything into this project everything and you know it'd be like your your example of san diego and coronado it would yeah. be like you are going to own san diego i'm yes. I mean, sorry you're going to own coronado island yeah. which yeah. you couldn't even put a value on oh yeah, yeah. on coronado island yeah. so your dad and like you said it's on if you go to if you're listening you go to google maps right now and you yeah. look up banana island yeah you can see it yeah. it's there you yeah. can see a bunch of houses on it they actually don't have any pictures inside it because it's like a closed property yeah. which you talk about in the end of the book but yeah. So your dad dumps all of his money in this? Everything, I mean, not just his money, he leveraged his art, he leveraged our, our compound, I mean, everything, because um, he he felt like it was gonna be successful. That was gonna be, so I mean, he would put so much money into it that my mom, being an American, would wisely tell him, Bios, please, mm-hmm. she would beg him, like, just put some money in the US, just put $2 million, $2 million in the US, that way if something happens, like we have a cushion to fall back yeah, on. Which, by the way, already happened a few years ago when yeah. you lost the first problem. Exactly, and that was one of the things that my mom said, would say to him, I don't trust this system. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and my, my mom and dad, from what I recall, they didn't argue much, I didn't see them argue much, but the, but the one time that they did argue or have disagreements, it was always about that. It was always about, I do not trust this system. And my mom, she's a New Yorker, mm-hmm. so she, she knew when somebody was scamming or walking mm-hmm. down the streets in New York. I mean, you kinda got to know what a hustler is in a hustler type system when you grow up in New York City so my mom would try to warn him over and over again but he was so loyal to this vision and he was so loyal to the people of Nigeria because he was like if I could just get here if I could just cross that line everything will be all right and everything will fall into place and he told my mom once once we start people all the contracts assigned and we start building the buildings and people start renting out office spaces and the companies start operating there, then I'll put money in, in, in the in the US. Mm-hmm. But until then, this is my priority. Well, as you can see, by the way we're both talking, it doesn't work out. And yeah. Yeah. like the the term they use in legal like like someone else in quotes, they yeah. say acquired yeah. the yeah. the the island. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just terrible. Yeah. Like, it's just terrible. Yeah. And, you know, I was, as you were explaining this too, I, I'm, th- I'm sure your dad was like, you know, your, your mom was probably like, we lost that property before. And he's like, yeah, but we got this other thing yeah. now. Like, it, it almost seemed like it was yeah. proof. Yeah. You, if you looked at it in a positive light, yeah. you could be, it could be proof that, see, we did get what, you know, we did get something from him and yeah. we still have this. Um, so this gets, like I said, air quotes, acquired slash stolen yeah. by another entity. Yeah. Um, your dad's company, the uh, the what is it, development center or the city development center? Yeah, city development, yep. Gets zero money for it. They get nothing. Yeah. So the Lagos state government, after con- they conveniently waited until all the work was done. I mean, for years, this is not something that happened overnight. For years, you know. The engineers were flying in. The equipment was being moved in. The the foreshore was being dredged. It was a pride. I mean, it was six interlinks. It was six, um, best way to explain it, plots of land that were created individually and then linked together. That doesn't happen overnight. And so the, the Lego state government and, and, you know, the federal government, I'm sure they were involved as well. They conveniently waited until everything was done. They saw that people were actually walking on the land and things were being built on the island. And it was like, OK, it works. Now let's go get it. And uh, the Lego state government came in and said that the federal government was never supposed to give him the lagoon for compensation because they tried to say that uh, uh, use some type of measurement and say the distance from the from the uh, from Ikoyi's shore to the foreshore it's like some mathematical equation the answer to that came out to be it's, it's within the uh, the Ikoyi so it belongs to the Lego state government and uh, yeah it was uh, and my dad didn't see it coming, and that's the thing, you know, and I, I, I say that that's my downfall sometimes now, you know, when I look back on on mistakes that I've made, and uh, is 
my dad was so driven that he couldn't see what was going on mm-hmm. on his peripherals. He was so focused and driven to get the job done that to him nothing bad was going to happen. And that and I, I and it's so crazy because I had a situation happen a few months ago where I was just like, I was just so driven. And Brad could attest to this because he was. You know, I was dealing with an issue with my publisher, and, and I just kept on pushing and pushing and pushing, and, and I didn't realize the conflict and the issues that that was causing, you know, for, for me to be pushing so hard. But it, I wanted, I had the best interest. My best interest was at heart, and the project's best interest was at heart. It wasn't like out of something malice. It was like I'm just so focused to get the job done that I couldn't see what was going on out here and how it was having a negative effect on the people around me. And that's what was that's what my dad was dealing with. And I know that I inherited that from my dad is that, you know, the drive is good. It's important to be driven, but you also have to check out from time to time and take a look right and left. Yeah, there's also a, a thing that can happen that can be a bit of a blind spot yeah. is like you or like this has happened to me. Yeah. I couldn't comprehend yeah. that someone would do something like yes. whatever. Like yes. someone's like gonna steal your freaking, you know, you you leave a something out on a counter. Yeah. You're like, you couldn't comprehend that someone yeah. would st- blatantly steal yeah. this. Yeah, and yet there's people that are gonna blatantly steal it. Yeah, so that can that can be a bit of a blind spot too. Maybe yeah. that's your dad had something like your yeah. dad's an a guy that's hardworking yeah. and straightforward. Yeah, he couldn't imagine. Yeah. That he could dump millions and millions and millions of dollars into this project, and yeah. that they would just take lawyers and take it all away from him. Yeah, and yeah. it's like a little bit of a blind spot too, where yeah. you can get caught. You don't yeah. expect people that can be. You don't think people can be freaking that evil. Yeah, no, and 100%. yet they can be. Yeah, and so it's, and you know you brought up a, a great point because when I got out of the military in 2016, like I I went into the film and TV business and other other businesses as well under the pretense that everybody has the same level of integrity as the people <laughs> that I, that I work with in the military mm-hmm. and uh, and I would get so upset when I was proven wrong because it was just like but but, but wait like you're supposed to show up on time yeah. you're supposed to keep your word <laughs> yeah you said you were going to do this yeah and it just doesn't happen like that so yeah that was a great point you know as some of the legal documents i saw about this the yeah. titles are still disputed i yeah. don't know if you know that there's yeah. still like disputed titles on who owns banana Isle, quote yeah. banana island now yeah which is which is kind of crazy like in america if you buy a house yeah. and there's a disputed or if you're buying a house and yeah. there's a disputed title you're like yeah. oh i'm not buying i'm gonna buy this thing yeah. so that's very interesting that the title's still disputed well it's well, there's a lot of this. You a lot back to and it. stake your claim. Yeah, yeah, flag yeah, in that yeah, thing. Yeah. I might have to go pull Put a black the black <laughs> flag on that bad yeah. boy. <laughs> there's a lot. They offered my family eight million dollars. They offered my brother. My brother's a my half brother's a lawyer. He's mm. been fighting the case since '87, and they offered him eight million dollars like five years ago, and he turned it four years ago, and mm-hmm. he turned it down. Oh yeah. So I mean. They know what's up. I yeah. mean, they they know what's up. And then I don't know if you remember the NSARS movement that happened um, in twenty twenty or twenty twenty one in Nigeria. It was like nope. a big movement where people were like protesting. As, I think the SARS was like a specialized police force that were you know that was taking advantage and and shaking people down. Which mm-hmm. you know corruption is something that's normal when police come and shake you down. And so. Um, they uh, uh, they part the protesters. Apparently, the story is the protesters went into the courthouse, the same courthouse where my dad's case has been in for like the last forty years, and they go into the records room and they burn down the records room, but the only files that are destroyed are the case files for Lagoon City. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is in twenty twenty one. Yeah, twenty twenty. So, you know, there's a lot, and, and before that, my they offered my debt, my brother $8 million mm-hmm. for our family, and he turned it down, because he was like, no, dude, like, my dad spent 8 million pounds on, yeah. on in Aragon. the 70s. In the 70s. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, at this point, it's like 1987, yeah. You and your you and your brother and your mom, yeah, yeah. you you guys decided to move to New York, yep. right? Yeah, yeah. And that was just like getting out of yeah. you know the country at the time seemed yeah. a little bit more stable, I guess, in America. What was the big yeah. push behind that? It was just it was a lot of going on, and my dad started getting threats. I mean, I didn't 
catalog it all in a book but my dad started getting threats my mom had started having crazy stuff happen to her like the horse bit her our our horse bit her and then like something else happened where she almost got run over uh by somebody that you know she was walk getting ready to cross the street and like a car just pulls up and just speeds past her and she jumps back in the street so they were there were a lot of things that were happening my dad was getting more and more threats even before the Lego state government came in and did what they did, he was getting threats from people, you know, in the government, people who were supposedly friends. They weren't threatening him directly, but they were passing a message for somebody. Mm -hmm. And so my mom, you know, my, me and my brother were her priorities, you know, and we were her only kids. And so for her, she was just like, I can't, I can't risk staying here, you know, at Ibayo. I need to I need to get my kids out of here while all of this stuff settles. And it was in that time where, you know, my dad died as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you and your brother and your mom moved to New York. Yeah. Your dad's traveling back and forth. Yeah. He's doing business. He's trying to make this thing happen. He gets bit by a freaking dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A rabid dog. Yeah. And yeah. then through some combination of that and the treatment that he got. Yeah. So the autopsy, so my dad got bit. Flew to Germany to go do some business. Well, got big, went to the hospital, got medication. Flew to Germany to go you know, do some type of business. Flew from Germany to New York, saw us for a beat, and then flew from New York back to Nigeria. He gets to um, he gets back to uh, Nigeria. My mom was pressing him. You got to take your medicine. You got to take your medicine. He's like, all right, I'll take it. Takes the medicine. Ultimately. The autopsy report showed that the medicine is ultimately what killed him. Um, and that's essentially what happened. And then from there, um, he was he couldn't fight. I mean, he because he, he was fighting them and he was no longer there to fight them and nobody else was. So, OK, the titles now belong to us. And your mom and you, you know, you talk about this and again. I'm only reading small parts. Get the yeah. book so yeah. you can read the details. But your mom flies back to Africa. Yeah. Meets with your brother. Yeah. And she's like, all right, let's go through the finances. Yeah. Let's see where we're at. Let's yeah. see how much, you know, how much I'm going to have. Yeah. And, and it's nothing. Nothing. Because everything was wrapped up in the island. Everything. And so we went from rich, <laughs> traveling the world, cars, nannies, hosting lavish parties. How much of that do you remember? A little bit. I remember my dad. Mm -hmm. More so than I, I remember events around my dad. Like I remember, you know, playing with him in our in our in our big living room quarters, living room area. I remember riding. You, in you remember the, that nice ass house, though. Oh yeah, I remember yeah. the house. I remember doing things in the house with him. I remember riding with him in the car because we had our driver Frederick who would drive us. My dad would play uh, Fulu Fulu Kuti, who was like a famous uh, Nigerian singer. He was against the government at the time and singing. So I remember I remember those little. I remember our private school that we went to and I, rem I, re I recall uh, this is one of my first memories um, I got into a fight with a kid because I the kids were making fun of me because my mom was American and it was a knuckle drag and fist fight you know two small kids and my dad came and my mom came to the school and uh, my mom was just, just she was upset at me you know, she was like, why are you doing that? Even? And my dad was just like, I'm proud of my son. <laughs> my son, thank you. My mom's looking at him like, what do you, why are you, why are you doing that? Why are you celebrating him? And my dad was just like, ah, oh, it's my boy, my Yoruba warrior. <laughs> and so uh, I have those memories. And, um, you know, it's so interesting because as a father now with four kids, certain things come to me, certain memories are triggered from my past when I do certain things with my kids or I say like certain events happen or even I find myself and this is the craziest thing. If one of my, especially my oldest son, my oldest son does something that he's he's just nine year old, he's not supposed to do, like something out of the norm, I will go into a pigeon accent <laughs> and sounding like my dad. Like, what do you what are you doing? <laughs> like seeing and I catch myself, I'm like, what did I just say? Where did that come from? It's like my dad, you know, jump jump through me. But yeah, it was uh it was a good life. Um but I'm I'm grateful for the way things turned out. Yeah. Cause I wanna be who I am without that horrible yeah. transition. So 
there's no money left. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna go back to the book here for a second. Yeah. And you say this, Africa is my birthplace, but the Bronx is my home. <laughs> yeah. There's no place on the planet like the Bronx. The food, the people, the culture, the music, it's a melting pot of everything, chaotic yet beautiful. On one block, Italians are serving up thin crust pizzas while right outside a group of Dominicans play dominoes and talk Yankees, salsa and merengue music blast from souped up civics, black Israeliites uh, stand on the corner taking questions from critics, Haitians, Jamaicans, Vietnamese, and Puerto Ricans, hustlers and ballers, both literal and figurative, all locked together with a, f- with a few Eastern Europeans. It's the Bronx, not Bronx, it's the Bronx. You know a person, place, or thing is special when you have to put the before it. We fight hard, we love hard. As a matter of fact, doesn't the Bronx sound hard? That's because it is hard. You go on to say, the Bronx molded me, formed me, and trained me in ways that no other place has. It, this was my environment. Africa is my birthplace, but the Bronx is my home. I can't tell you much about the land of my birth, but I can tell you all about the Bronx. I love the Bronx, both the good and the bad. Yeah. So you're in the Bronx. Yeah, man. <laughs> uh, you're in a place called uh, the Fordham Hill Oval. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. is like a, it's for the Bronx, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a not. It's probably the nicest spot. Well, now it is. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it definitely yeah, now yeah, it is. Yeah, 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 but, yeah. It's very squared away now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it, well, even back then, wasn't it still like a gated, like a like a gated kind of more squared away place? It was. A, it's a co op, so it's like yeah, it was. It, it was definitely better than right outside the gates. But yep. it, it was. It was a co op and uh, middle class to you know about middle class mm-hmm. area, and it was the only. Thing that my dad left us, yep. really, because my dad, when he was when he started doing his business in in in, at, in New York City at the World Trade Center, he uh, you know he he needed a place to bed down, he needed a place to operate, and in this and and Fordham Hill actually was a predominantly white area in the six. I mean, the Bronx in and of itself, like in the before white flight, I think took place like around the fifties or sixties or something like that, was a predominantly Irish, Italian, you know, white area. Mm-hmm. And Fordham Hill was that as well. And so that's when my dad bought it was a completely different place. But then after, you know, that and the crack epidemic yeah. and all of those things brought everything went downhill. Yeah, this is the late eighties. Yeah. And the late 80s, New York City was a totally different place than oh, it yeah. is now. Oh, yeah, 100%. 100%. And yeah. these areas of the Bronx that you're talking about, like across, like across the street from Fordham Hill. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's like what, yeah. it's almost like a stereotypical rundown city. Yeah. Like, yeah. that's what it is. That's, yeah. what the Bron- that's what the Bronx is and looks yeah. like up there. Um, And that's where you're in. Yeah, man, that's what you're in. So, you know, again, hey, everybody, get the book, read the book. You got all yeah. kinds of crazy tales in there. But <laughs> what was, uh, tell us a little bit about life with, with Dante, Elijah, Charles Showtime, Deshaun, yeah. Erica, Dennis, Kenny Monkey, yeah. Chris the Joker, yeah. and uh, Ricardo and Roberto. The Dominican duo. Oh, man. What would you guys have going on? Oh, we had a lot going on, <laughs> man. We, we, that was like my mini buds, brother. <laughs> we would play kick the door and run. We would play manhunt, you know, where we split up in teams. And then when you find members of the other team, you beat them up or rough them up. Um, I remember the older kids in the in the uh, in the park. They they got chalk and they would they drew like a squared uh, boxing uh, boxing ring and they would bet on on us younger kids, you know, who was gonna win and we would slap box. So we would have these slap and you couldn't back out of it. It was just like, nope, you're going in. <laughs> hey, I don't care if you're crying, you're going in. So you, we fought. A, it was so crazy because all of us like. I had fights with Dante, but then we would be friends like the next day. I had me and Elijah every summer. We had like a brawl, like a bloody brawl. We fight, and then like the next day, we would be playing with each other. And even Erica, I remember Erica. She was the tomboy. She would hang out with us. She could scrap. And her and Ricardo (laughs) got into a fight, and then her brother Scott came and beat up Ricardo. But then we were all buddy buddy again. And so it was a good crew, man. And. those memories are so funny. We were in Fordham Hill yesterday. I went. I was in New York yesterday and uh, saw one of the guards, or Captain Robinson. He 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 was a main guard while we were there, and then he went to go work at Yankee Stadium. And he came back recently, and he, we saw each other. He's like, 
Remy, <laughs> like you're not doing the crazy stuff anymore. And my mom told you, like, nah, he was he was a frog man, and he's in California. He's like, what are you like? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, but it was it was just it was a, a such a phenomenal hard upbringing, but a from a phenomenal uh, upbringing at yeah. the same time. But, yeah, there's something that I think I don't know if this is because of social media or because we know yeah. more now. We know more like about the bad things that yeah. happen in the world, but yeah. you know when I was a kid. Like you would just go out like kids yeah. just went out yeah. with no parental supervision at yeah. all and it didn't really matter yeah. like you weren't expected no one was worried about you like yeah. today your kids go out you know and you're thinking like oh gosh there's freaking kidnappers and molesters yeah. and like all, all this bad stuff could happen yeah that stuff was happening yeah. no just no one knew about yeah. it and so you just go out and do what you're gonna do and it, you know it, that's what the book you know your mom's working she's yeah. a teacher right she's a teacher in the South Bronx yeah so she's a teacher, so yeah. that means you know you're home alone a lot. You mm. got things going on. You got your crew, yeah. and you're just rolling out and getting after it. Um, like you said, though, it's a rough. It's rough, man. Yeah. And uh, I go to the book here. It says, "In the midst of our dreaming chaos, intruded, pop, pop, pop." Yeah. The shot started off, then erupted into a barrage. A car pulled up on the southbound side of the street, directly to the left of us, and started shooting up the building at two fifty twenty five fifty nine Sedgwick. Yeah. The targets of the drive-by shoot started shooting back in our direction, and before we knew it, we were in the middle of a shootout. I froze, not knowing what to do. It was like everything was happening in slow motion. I can't remember what bay. You say bayo or bio? Bio. 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 Yeah. I can't remember what bio was doing, but Ro- Romel took charge. He looked at me and yelled, "Come on, Remy!" Instead of moving, I slowly turned my head to look back in the direction of the hill. Romel grabbed Corey and threw him over his left shoulder to shield Corey from the bullets. Then he pushed bio, which prompted me to, which prompted my brother to sp- start sprinting back to the hill. After receiving one last verbal lashing from Romel, I snapped out of my frozen state and started sprinting to catch up. We all ran as fast as we could. I don't know how Romel was able to do it, but he was way ahead of bio and me the whole time, even while carrying Corey over his shoulder. Just when we thought we had made it out of the furnace, the, s- the car started speeding in- south in our direction. I will never forget the thought that popped into my mind. They have to kill us, we're the only witnesses. They're coming to kill us. Despite that thought, I kept running as hard as I could. As the car got closer, I thought, this is it. Then just like that, the car sped by, running the red light where Sedgwick and Bailey Avenues met. We sprinted back to the entrance of the hill, stopped to check each other for bullet holes, then made our way in. Let's just say that when we got back up to the apartment and told mom what happened, she didn't let us walk didn't let us walk the other way to Corey's apartment. Instead, Uncle Kirk made the drive over to pick up Corey, and my Army vet uncle made sure to bring his gun. I'll never forget 2559 Sedgwick Avenue for two reasons. One, it was the first place I recall almost losing my life. Two, a few years later, it would be the same building where Dina Taylor, Bio's close friend and classmate, would be murdered. Just like us, Dina wasn't bothering anybody. We were all just kids who happened to be in the wrong place in the wrong time. Yeah. So yeah, that's the Bronx. Yeah, man. And in that time period, there was all kinds of crime. Yeah. And you were just back there. How is it now? <laughs> worse. It's worse. It's worse, man. The gangs oh, are more right. out of control. And then with this, like, I don't even know, it's this new type of rap, hip hop, where you got these kids going on social media and and making and rapping these negative lyrics against another gang so they ain't rolling up and murdering people the high school that I went to teachers are getting murdered a teacher got murdered recently what, like two or three teachers got r- murdered recently kids are killing each- it's it's bad I mean Brad knows he we would drive it through and he was like we gotta get, we gotta get out of here but it's it's sad mm-hmm. and and I and I've tried I've tried to go to my high school and talk to the students and, and I couldn't get in because I have to cut through, go through so much red tape to get in, but it's bad, man. It's 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 disheartening to see that not, that not only has it not changed for the good, it's changed for the worse. Yeah, that's crazy because, you know, for a while, New York did change and yeah. it was definitely in a better situation yeah. in like the late 90s. And yeah, Giuliani. Yeah, he Giuliani came, down, came down, in and yeah. cracked down on a yeah. lot of crime. Yeah. And then, and it definitely, I mean, when I was a kid going to New York, it was like, it was freaking crazy in the late 80s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, there was just drugs everywhere, uh, hookers out on the street. It it was crazy. Like, you would go walking down the street, and 
like around Hell's Kitchen or something, yeah. and there would be hookers. There'd be probably three to four hookers on every yeah. street corner. Yeah. And, yeah. and we're talking like movie looking, yeah. you know, hookers. And there was people offering you drugs. The Every three steps you took, somebody offered you drugs. Oh, yeah. It was bad. Yeah. And um, and then, man, by the time I went, the, I joined the Navy. And by the time I would yeah. go back there when I was a little older, and now it was like the 90s. Yeah. The mid 90s, the late 90s. It was a total, Times yeah. Square is totally, totally different. different. Yeah. Totally different. Yeah. Yeah. And now it's going back in the other direction again. Yeah, especially in Bron- I mean, the park that I grew that I um, grew up next to. So walk outside the Fordham Hill gates. Devoe Park is right there. You have to walk through the park to get to any part of Fordham Hill. And I remember being a kid, and you see crackheads strung out. You see people selling drugs mm-hmm. right there in front of you. I'm playing basketball in the basketball court, and. People are selling, and it's just normal. Hey, look the other way. A drug dealer looks your way. If you're playing and you're looking at them, you better turn your head really, really quick. You know, I remember going into the corner stores. You know, I was showing Brad the corner stores when we were there yesterday and seeing the mafia guys come in with the big collars, slick back here, and and, and collecting their tax, coming in, and the, and the store owner gives them an envelope with a bunch of cash, and then he walks. So that, that was the environment then. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, to think, like, as a kid, I remember walking to school and I, I must have been about, I was in middle school at this time, so I must have, no, I was just about to go to middle school, so I had to be about 10 or 11, maybe 12, and seeing grown men beating up kids, you know, just just you know slamming it cause, because a kid said something, and that's that was one thing that happened to me. I ended up getting beat to a pulp once on a, on, on a basketball court for having a disagreement or talking junk to a kid my age. And then that kid went and got his uncle who had just got released from prison and got his brother. His uncle was about 35 years old. The brother was like 19. I was eight at the time. I got slammed. And I remember being so scared walking to school because I would always say, it's this, it's this one I'm going to get jumped. Because the initiations at the time, too, was, you know, if you, in order to get into the gang, you got to beat up an innocent person. As a matter of fact, there was this big thing that was going on, going around. It was all over the news. In order to get into the gang, they had to give somebody a buck fifty. It cost a dollar fifty to ride the train. And so, what the gang, what the blood gangs would do is they would get on the train, and the new the new member would have to go up to somebody that the senior member picked out, and innocent person didn't do anything, pull out a blade and slash their face. And uh, that was called the buck 50. So my mom would always tell me, if you get on the train, keep your eyes open. You see any red, anybody with red, get off the train, walk to the next car, but don't don't play around because you don't want to get your face sliced. And you'd see people walking down Fordham Road, the street I grew up on, with big scars on it, and girls. Not just men, women as well. You know, so it was, it was rough, but it was, it really helped me learn the importance of being attentive and looking around and being and reading people and not taking people for face value like really th- looking at the situation trying to dive into what's this person's intent you know because if not <laughs> you know I'm dead so you get to this point um you i'm gonna highlight this uh, yeah. conversation you had talking to your mom you say yeah. Do you ever think we'll get the money back from the Nigerian government? I asked. Mom gave me a response that I would hear a million times. I wouldn't hold your breath for it. All we have to work with is what God has given us. Don't count on anything else. Many light, many nights later, I sat on our trundle bed. I began to reflect on my life in the Bronx. Bio was out in the living room watching TV, and I was in our room alone thinking about mom's financial struggles, the bad things I had experienced in my short life, and the life I felt we should be living, the life that was stolen from us. We had one lamp in our bedroom that sat out on our only dresser, and the lampshade had been thrown away probably because we broke it. Right below the lamp was a framed picture of Chief. I got up from the bed, walked over to the picture, and picked it up with both hands. And for the first time, it finally hit me. Your father is dead. He's never coming back, and this is your life. I was so young when my father died that I couldn't understand it, but it was in that moment of reflection that I finally grieved my father's absence for the first time. I broke down crying. 
My life wasn't structured for me to succeed, and I was finally realizing it. Inner city life, a single mother, financial hardship, violence, a subpar school system, and fatherlessness. My mom must have heard my cries from the living room because she quickly rushed in and asked what was wrong. It took me a while to get it out, but I finally told her. I miss my dad. I wish he was here so we could have a better life. Mom put her arms around me and she comforted me. She assured me that everything would be all right. We would make it. In her demeanor, if not in her words, she summarized the title of that Tupac song. I know it looks like things will never change, but my son, you must keep your head up. Mom did the best job she could, but as I grew older and taller, my fear of her maternal presence began to wane and the absence of my father loomed large. The next part of the book that you go into, um, you start talking about filling that, filling that, uh, the the void yeah. of not having a dad. Yeah, and you fill it. Get some different components that fill it. Biggie, yeah, Rakim, yeah. KRS One, yeah. right? So yeah, even nah. some West Coast Snoop Dogg yeah. starts to fill it, which yeah. I was a little surprised to see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, then you, so you had that. You had. TV, right? So yep. you saw the Fresh Prince, you know, with uh, Will Smith. Music you saw videos. Martin. You saw music videos. They had movies. Um, you had uh, Bad Boys yeah. with with Will Smith and yeah. Martin in it. Whatever happened to Martin? He's still doing his thing. I yeah. think they're shooting. They, they're shooting Bad Boys Four now. Oh damn! Yeah, that like, well before the right before the strike, the actor strike oh, okay. they were. Yeah. Um, yeah. Bad Boys. And and this is interesting. I noticed in the book you talk about the director Michael Bay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which like when I was a kid watching movies, I didn't care about any directors yeah, yeah, yeah. or anything. But yeah. you you somehow yeah. some, had some kind of in in like understanding of directors, no, even it, as a kid. Yeah, well, it was because they would. He, he had two movies that came out. Bad yeah. Boys uh, was my favorite movie of all time. Uh, even to this day, and I remember as a young kid, it really hit me hard because, as I mentioned in the book, yeah. that was the first time I saw two two guys who looked like me, but they were playing heroes, and it planted that seed that I could be something other than a drug dealer, athlete, or uh, or, or a rapper. And and so I studied that movie to nauseam. I remember, as a matter of fact, right after it came out, I bought the bootleg version of it, <laughs> and it, with a guy holding a camcorder, and, <laughs> and, and, and I remember watching it, and rewinding and watching it, and I went to my Uncle Mike's house, and uh, I was like, Uncle Mike, you gotta watch this, and I just, I watched everything, read through the credits, listened to the music, watched the music video that came along with it, and so that was like my first like introduction to not just the, uh, the, the what's on the screen but behind the screen you know because I wanted to know everything about this movie and then so Michael Bay's name popped you know um, for me uh, especially being being that I studied the movie religiously and then two years later The Rock came out so when I saw Michael Bay pre- director of Bad Boys new movie rock i was like oh rock i'm gonna go see this so that's kind of how the name popped in my head yeah so you go see the rock Mm -hmm. and you say this about going to see the rock (laughs) (laughs) green light on the seal incursion a character in the film said the seals received the go-ahead to sneak onto alcatraz rescue the hostages and defuse the missiles as i sat on the edge of my seat i got my first insight into these bold men who these bold men were and what they did. Their gear was state of the art. They didn't seem uptight in the way other military units were often portrayed in film. Their movements were smooth and precise, and each member of the team, though unique, operated cohesively with everyone else. I would later find out that the guys playing SEALs were so convincing because Michael Bay hired real Navy SEALs for the roles. Then came the iconic shower room shootout. Spoiler alert. The SEALs are discovered, a shootout ensues, and the Marines kill all the SEALs. One might think that this would leave a bad impression with me, but it didn't. Even after the movie ended, I couldn't get Navy SEALs out of my mind. The scene of the SEALs rising out of the water to sacrifice themselves to save others kept replaying in my head. I recognized something honorable in that. Something special about that group of men somehow resonated with me. Bad boys planted the seed that I could one day be a hero. The Rock planted the seed of the type of hero I would want to be if I ever could. 
In the weeks that followed, I learned as much as I could about the Navy SEALs. And one day, I made the commitment to myself, Remy, if you can ever become something special, it's going to be a Navy SEAL. <laughs> How old were you when you saw that movie? I must have been 16, 15, 16. So beginning to have some cohesive thoughts about the world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're getting there. Yeah. Uh, but but you still have a ways to go. A uh, long way to go, yeah. In, in fact, your, uh, your next chapter in the book is called Hustler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, this is when you start doing, you know, you start doing bad shit. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. God, you steal your mom's engagement yeah, ring. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, you know, to this day, that's something that I, 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 I regret. That's something that I wish I can go back in time and take back because that was the only thing that my father left her. But I, I was so going back to me, that whole driven part. I was driven in the wrong way. Mm-hmm. You know, I wanted affirmation. I think every boy needs a man to teach him how to be a man, but also to affirm him. And every girl needs a father to her, affirm her so that she's not looking for affirmation from wrong sources. Mm-hmm. And for me, affirmation came from getting money or making money and my friend saying, you the man and mm-hmm. you this and you that. And so that's that was the substratum of why I did what I did. I'm not justifying it in any way, but I was looking for that pat on my back from mm-hmm. my dad that I couldn't get and stealing that ring and I can't even remember it wasn't more than maybe the ring was probably worth 15 20 grand and I only got like maybe $200 for it yeah uh-huh. it's a disturbing read in yeah. the book you yeah. talk about you're bringing it into this pawn shop and yeah. you know you know the you know the ring's worth whatever 10 yeah. 15 grand yeah. And the guys, I could give you 150. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think maybe you get them up to 200. But, yeah. uh, and you got all kinds of things going on. You yeah. were, you're working at a sneaker store. Yeah. You start yeah. taking cash, yeah. you know, for for sneakers. Yeah. So you're selling people just you know not not put them in the register and yeah. pocketing that money. Uh, you you in high school you're kind of just barely getting by. Yeah. Matter of fact, when you're about to graduate from high school, you find out you're not going to graduate high school. And so in the book, you say you had to write a 50-page report in a weekend. But, you know, no, the reality was, no, it was in the night. And and the reality was I I changed it from it was actually a 100-page report. For the book, I cut it down to 50 because I was like, you know what? It's too unrealistic. Yeah, people are not going to believe me if I put it in in 100. So let let me put it down to 50. But the reality was it was 100. And how and the I, hell did you write a hundred pages in the night? Bro? I just put in. I I was driven. I I want to. I don't want to. I didn't want to get left back. The worst thing that could happen to you, at least for me at the time, the worst thing that could happen when, where everybody would call you stupid and do the opposite of affirm you uh-huh. is if you ever got left back. And I didn't want to get left back, and I didn't want to drop out, and I didn't want to have anything to do with school anymore. <laughs> so that's what drove me. And yeah, the uh, Mr. Wolf, I'll never forget. He said, "Write a paper on why English is important." And I figured it out, man. Do you still have that paper? I, you know, my mom, Brad knows this. We were in my mom's house yesterday. She brought out a whole folder of of papers that I've uh, that I had been that she would make me write. She would make me write from the time I was a small mm-hmm. kid, and the date it was. I I didn't see though that paper. Damn. I think I had to turn it in though. I think I turned it into the uh, the teacher. I don't think I got that one back. Mm-hmm. Well, um. So you got you're doing you're just doing bad shit. You're yeah, doing yeah. that, but you but once you get it get out of high school. Uh, that's what I kind of opened up with. Yeah. I had to take the opportunity to open up with yeah, something, yeah, you know, yeah. just you out Exciting. there. Yeah, <laughs> selling drugs, man. Yeah, yeah. So you go through that phase. But what's interesting, in the end of that section I read, I start uh, talking about how you you were yeah. saying you needed something bigger, something yeah. with more money. Yeah. And what that ended up being, that ended up being uh, actually sell, uh, selling phones. cell phones. Yeah, to drug dealers, yeah. And you end up making good money doing that. A lot that. of money. Tens of thousands of dollars a week. It was crazy. It was nuts. So talk us through that scam. What were you doing? So essentially, it's in the book, but like, just yeah. I don't want to read that whole section. No, it's all good. So essentially, um, uh, I got a, I got a, I was able to get a license, a cell phone selling, a cell phone license through a company. I won't mention that company name in the book. I call them WTC, <laughs> and uh, and this guy who worked there essentially showed me how to activate phones on lines of credit. So essentially, uh, well, well, 
on other people's lines right. of credit, people who weren't <laughs> who weren't trying to get the phone. So essentially, uh, depending on a person's credit, you can activate up to three cell phone lines, and then you had you want to receive your bill until the thirty day mark, and then you had. 30 days from there, which was a 60 day mark to pay your bill. And if the bill wasn't paid by the 90 day mark, then the phone would cut off. Mm -hmm. So essentially it was a, it was a free phone and you didn't, and up front there was no payment. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like, uh, buy the phone for $200 and then get a bill because the cell phone company was making this, its money, more of its money in the, in the actual monthly bill because mm -hmm. it was twenty nine ninety nine a month for 30 minutes. Who talked for thirty minutes? I mean, <laughs> even think about it now. But who talked for thirty minutes? Especially when cell phones became a thing, nobody talked for thirty minutes. Everybody was going fifty minutes, sixty, three, four hours, and then you know the cell phone companies were making crazy money because I think it was like five cents a minute or something ridiculous like that after you exceeded your thirty minutes. And so, so yeah, I was uh, I partnered up with a guy um, who I went to high school with, and he had a girlfriend that worked at a hospice clinic. And so he, his girlfriend would get me a sheet of paper, and it's like five or six people's names on it, and be named their name, and these are people who are about to die, expire. So their name, date of birth, social security, and address. And then I would plug that in, I would call up, would use my license, call, call up the company, and say, hey, I have Ricardo Regalado, you know, just on a random name, and here's the social, here's this, and then they would run, the person on the line would run and run the credit, be like, oh, he qualifies for three phones, perfect. I'll take all three, and then I would, I would receive the phones from the company as well, so I would have the box, and I would read the number, the serial code number to the operator, and they would activate three phones. And, uh, and then I would then sell those phones, um, I started out selling to random people, but then I, for the most part, the majority of my clients were drug dealers because they liked the phone. The phone would stay on for 90 days and it was a burner phone and it would go turn off and then they would come back to me and get another one and then they would use How it How much did they pay days. you for a phone? It depended, on, it depended on the phone. So the cheapest phone, I would, my memory search was like around $300, so uh -huh. I would sell it for The most expensive phone was $900 and that was the Motorola Tic Tac phone uh -huh. because it was like, it looked like a Tic Tac and it was really small and guys liked it because it was, it was cool and then there were the Motorola two-way pagers. Mm -hmm. uh, they came in like silver and, and black and the, Jay-Z and all these artists made them super popular because they went to music videos. Uh -huh. and, uh, and so I would sell those for about 500 a pop. And uh, again, they would stay on for 90 days as well. Guys could text, do what they needed to do, cut off, come back to me, here's another one. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was rolling in the money, man. Mm -hmm. I bought a brand new car. Uh, I remember driving it right off the dealership downtown Manhattan, not too far from uh, from. Um, what did you uh, get? Wasn't it a Lexus or something? A Lincoln. A Lincoln, Lincoln LS. That's right. Yeah. The Lincoln LS. Hell yeah, yeah man. You got that in the book. Dude. Yeah, <laughs> the Lincoln LS. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I was I was um, started my record company, essentially laundering the money through the company, so that that way we could we could make music and I could kind of hide the money there. And this uh, is eighth wonder eighth records wonder entertainment. Yeah. Eighth yeah, wonder yeah, entertainment. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. now you got some, some rap artists that yeah. you're helping yeah. produce. You getting yeah. studio time and yeah, stuff for paying for studio time, paying for, you know, when it came to shows and we needed to, the guys needed new clothes and boots and all that stuff. So they could look the part, pay for that. Um, we would go down to Virginia beach Interestingly, I went in the, we go down to Virginia Beach and record down there. Port, uh, was it Portsmouth, Virginia? Portsmouth. Yeah, Portsmouth, Virginia. And we found a DJ down there that would make beats for us. So, yeah, that's where a lot of the money was going to. Now, you get a, at one point in the book, and this is a big part of the book because yeah. it's kind of a turning point for you. Yeah. You get confronted by this guy. What's his name? Devon? Devon, yeah. Devon, yeah. yeah. He's a drug dealer that yep. you've given a bunch of phones through. Yeah. And the phones got cut off yeah. after a short, very short period of time. Yeah. So he came back to you like, yo, yeah. uh, these things aren't working. Yeah. You realize or you at least suspect that yeah. the phone company's on to you. Yeah. Yeah. Because how many freaking people have <laughs> yeah. not paid for the phones yeah, yeah, that you've yeah. sold? Yeah. Were you doing any legit business at this time? Yeah, I was. Okay, so, yeah, yeah, okay. so, so I was always smart about it. I was always smart. About, okay, if I'm going to sell 
for every three phones that I sold illegally, like I needed to sell at least like seven, eight or nine phones. That way I was covering my basis. So if somebody ever came and investigated me, I could say, hey, like this was a legit customer. Here's the ID Mm because they would I I would also get like a driver's license, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, a a photo of the driver's license to prove that, Mm -hmm. hey, like, yeah, this person. And so the the guy at hospice, his girlfriend would be able to get me the pictures of the driver's license as well. So if anything did come up, I could say, hey, like this is the person. I met with and there's their signature I don't know what's going on and here are all my other legit clients Mm. I got scammed you know Mm. Um, and 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 so I was really really smart about not going overboard and until I met Devin right and he comes to your house with a freaking yeah, uh, he's gonna kill you. Or yeah, he's he's, he's telling yeah, you like hey, I'm gonna kill you if you don't give me my freaking money. Yeah, but see it was all his fault because When he approached me initially and said hey, I want to buy bulk. I said no and I was like, that's not the way this works. If I if you if I do bulk, then I'm gonna it's gonna mess up my ratio. And there were guys that were getting caught, maybe not in my company, other companies. Mm-hmm. There was one guy in my company they were getting caught, prosecuted, and sent to federal prison. It's a federal crime. Why is it a federal crime? Oh, because uh, you're 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 you're, you're stealing ID? people's personal identification, information, okay. identification, and you're activating lines of credit. So you knew this, and so yeah. you thought. I'm not gonna go sell you bulk. No, nope, I told him no, and then he just kept on pressing, kept on pressing. Come on, man, it'll be fine. Just try one time. Mm-hmm. Now you just, bl- just so you know, I wrote a book called Extreme Ownership, and you yeah. just blamed him for this app. You said it's his <laughs> I, fault. Uh, we well, can't let that slide, bro. That's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. In retrospect, <laughs> I thought it was his fault, but the reality is, I was an idiot. I was, I mean, I was, I was a, the brains behind the operation. Yeah. So it, it all, it all uh, falls on me. But so he yeah. comes to you now. You think, oh, they're on to me. I'm. Th- I'm scared. As a matter of fact, when he when he threatened me, I wasn't even thinking about him. Mm-hmm. I didn't even see him. <laughs> you know what I mean? I saw federal prison. Federal prison. Mm-hmm. You know, and and you know, um, Rod is actually still in prison to this day. Um, who I used to hustle with, and what's he? What do you go to prison for? Uh, strong arm robbery. Mm-hmm. You know, drugs. Mm-hmm. All that. I mean, he yeah. got. And the crazy thing is. After I got into the teams, I met Rod. You know, he he got clean for a little bit. I met him. He got clean for a little bit. He was a bus driver, and then he fell back into it. He he would call me up and and, and talk about how he was struggling. I'd be like, "Yo, don't do it. Don't fall back." And then finally, he was like, "I can't." And he fell back into a strong arm robbery in Pennsylvania. He did his time there. As soon as he got released from prison in Pennsylvania, he had charges in Jersey, so he got thrown right right back into prison in Jersey. Mm-hmm. So he's still in prison in Jersey right now to this day. So speaking of charges, you did get rolled up for uh, yeah. eating a freaking burger, burger at McDonald's, yeah, yeah. right? So you got that in there, yeah. and that plays a little bit of a role because mm. now you have a record. Yeah. So you get rolled up, yeah. typical like kind of cops are harassing you guys. Yeah, You're, yeah. A, you know, just shit. This is the kind of shit that happens, yeah. you know. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you guys get you get arrested. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's at a McDonald's. Um, you end up quitting your job. Yeah. With the phone thing. You're like, all yeah. right, I'm out. Federal yeah. prison doesn't sound like a yeah, good deal. Yeah, and I wrote a letter. Uh, had my mom help me write in my letter because in my stupid mind, I felt, oh, if I write a letter and quit uh, and explain that the reason why I'm quitting is because there's just too much craziness going on. If they ever discovered that it was me, they can't prosecute me because I quit. <laughs> I don't know why I thought that. That, that would freaking co- <laughs> Just covering your tracks. Yeah, let, me, let me quit before I get prosecuted. <laughs> oh, well, I think you can get prosecuted even if you do quit, Remy. Right? <laughs> um, Wait, in, sorry, who was the letter to? Who it, was to letter it was to? to the. It was to my boss at the company. Uh, yeah, so I there do. was a woman that I had to report into, <laughs> and she loved me. I mean, she was, uh, you know, because you were making I was her a lot of money, man. I was man. making a lot mm-hmm. of money. She even cried when I when I came to her, and gave her the letter, and she was just like, "Why, are you, like, you're doing so good here?" And I was just like, "It's too much craziness going on." Yeah. So you got that going on. Yeah. You quit that. Once you quit that, now you don't have the money that you had yeah. to fund uh, Eighth Wonder. Yeah. So now you're starting to scramble and trying to make something happen there. And you had a connection, who had a connection, who had a connection or something along those lines with with Kevin Lyles, who's like, I think at this time he might have been the president of Def Def Jam. Jam. Um, And so you get a meeting with the the president of Def Jam Records. I mean, this is as good as it gets. And uh, so you, Kevin Lyles, here, let me go to the book. 
Mr. Lyles, your visitors are here, the assistant said. Mr. Lyles stood up and said, come on in, guys. Yeah. He had a warm, comforting spirit about him. He yeah. wasn't intimidating, but I could tell he was all business. Willie embraced him with a handshake and said, these are the guys I've been working with. I think they got some good stuff for you. After Willie made the introductions, he stepped into the corner and stood there with his hands in his pockets. What would happen for the remainder of the meeting was now on me. Okay, okay, wh- what's your name again, Mr. Lyles Act? asked. I'm Remy. I'm the CEO and founder of Eighth Wonder Records, and these are my artists. Do you have music with you? He asked. I handed our CD to Mr. Lyles. Yes, here's our compilation album that we produced. He read the print on the cover. Who will discover the eighth wonder of the world? (laughs) (laughs) Interesting. Let's see what you got. Mr. Lyles popped the CD into his player and started listening. Our album was set up with what we thought was the best songs first because we intended the CD to be a demo also. As the music played, I watched Mr. Lyles intently. He only listened to snippets of each song. He nodded a little, seemed disinterested in some songs and interested in others. The good news was that he listened to some of every song. I honestly didn't know what to think. My assessment was that he could lean either way. Finally, he spoke, and when he did, he was direct. Um, Yeah, it's good, but it's not there. My heart sank, but I maintained my composure. He continued, let me play you something that's popping. I just signed an artist named Joe Budden. His album isn't out yet, but check this out. This is the kind of stuff we're looking for, for artists that pop. So he plays this, you're just trying to like freaking act cool. (laughs) Then you say, uh, we said our goodbyes to Mr. Lyles and we thanked him for his time and honesty and made our way out of the building. We were finally out. When we were finally out, we stood at the southeast corner and talked. I tried to motivate the troops the best I could, telling them that we'd find another way, but deep down, I knew it was over. There was no way I could keep funding Eighth Wonder at the same level. <sighs> so that's that. Yeah. Um, what? Where are you? Because at some time around here is when 9-11 happens. Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, that event with Def Jam was January 2002. Everything that happened with Devin happened in November, December 2001. Mm-hmm. Um, I watched the Twin Towers come down. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, I went, um, my mom woke me up on September 11th at like 9 a.m. and uh, told me what was going on. There was a girl I was dating at the time. She lived uh, like two, two, three buildings down. She called me up and told me to come to her, uh, come meet her at her apartment, went to her apartment. We went up on the roof and uh, she was trying to call her cousin because mm-hmm. a cousin worked at Windows of the World and uh, wasn't getting through. Mm-hmm. And then we both watched the towers come down from like the 18th, floor on well, 17th floor in the mm-hmm. building so the 18th uh, the roof uh, of the building and yeah that was that was crazy man um sirens back and forth all day all night long mm-hmm. it was horrific man um but it brought the city together that was the one thing that i remember everybody regardless of race regardless of what neighborhood you know, just it was like New York just came together in a way that I had never seen before. But it was uh it was absolutely horrific. It didn't I remember watching when I was on the roof, watching the Twin Towers getting ready to come down, a part of me was like, Man, I wanna go do something. Like I wanna I wanna go like I want to go get those who did the did whatever happened because nobody really knew what had happened yet at that point. We didn't know if it was you know the plane flying by accident. Nobody really knew what was happening until the second plane hit. It was like okay, this is an accident, but we didn't know who it was. We didn't know if, you know some pilots made a pack or what. And a part of me just wanted to go in and and get revenge, um, but then that faded really really quick because of what I was involved in Mm -hmm. from a hustling standpoint and focus being focused on making money. Yeah. Yeah. And you had this dream of the music, right? I mean, you're putting in work to try and make that happen as well. You got the meeting coming up with Def Jam. I mean, that's freaking yeah. Legit. Um, I'm gonna fast forward a little bit. Yeah. As I lay there in bed, I heard a voice say, you need to get out of here. You need to join the military. It was the type of voice you hear off in the distance within a dream, the way someone speaks to you while you're asleep. But I wasn't dreaming. I was awake. In a state of bemusement, 
I prompt my head up to look around, but there was no one in the room but me. The voice said it two more times, but softer than the first, even softer, even softer on the last. You need to join the military. You need to join the military. Now, I'll be honest. I smoked a lot of weed in my teenage <laughs> years, and in the process of getting high, I did experience some freaky events, but I hadn't been high for at least three weeks before this. I was clean, I promise. Not only was the voice audible, but it penetrated my mind and reverberated through my very being. It got my attention. I sat up and just stared into the room. And as I stared, I actually began to entertain the idea of joining the military. What do I have left? I have nothing else to do. Then I shook my head and began a silent argument. No, I can't do that. I hate the police. And anyone in uniform is the police. No. Plus, I like my hat backward and my clothes baggy, so there's no way I'm slipping into one of those tight-ass sailor boy (laughs) costumes. No. Full of frustration and anger, I laid back down and stared at the ceiling. Damn, damn, damn. I ain't got nothing left. I took a deep sigh and began to whisper. If you don't leave, man, you're probably going to end up dead or in prison. If I lay... I lay there for about 30 minutes trying to figure out what else I could do in my life and nothing came up. Finally, I capitulated. All right, I'm going to do it. What else do I have left? The decision made was made. I was all in. Yeah. And boom, like that, next thing you know, you're going to recruiters. Yeah, yeah. You go to the Army. You, you talk a little bit to the Army. Yeah. Um, you end up at a Marine recruiter who's yeah. trying to get you. You see the you see like a Force Recon picture. Yeah. You're like, yo, that's it. Yeah, no one's in there. Uh, no one's in there. Yeah. And then you go into the Navy recruiter, yeah, and you get uh, Petty Officer Tiana Re- Reyes. Yeah, Tiana Reyes. Yeah. Tiana Reyes, and she's she's good to go. Yeah, man. Um, as she starts running your record and stuff, yeah. little background check. She she finds out here. She says you have a warrant for arrest in New York, and you have a warrant for arrest in New Jersey. What was the New Jersey arrest? Was that traffic uh, or something? That was that was uh, speeding, or reckless something? driving. I was doing like something like 120 and a <laughs> and like a like a 65 or 70 something stupid yeah. and and uh, I didn't stop at first and because I I knew the cops were behind me I knew the, the sirens but I tried to play it off like they weren't ch- but I eventually pulled it wasn't like a high speed chase uh-huh. and then when they pulled me over they were like what do you why didn't you stop? It's like, oh, I didn't know you. You going 120 miles an hour? <laughs> sirens? Who else do you think we're chasing? <laughs> and I never went to court. Uh, I, you know, I and, and yeah. even with the whole, you know, the thing that happened with the res- resisting arrest and disobeying a lawful order, like that happened. I got arrested and went to jail. I never went to court. Mm-hmm. I was just like, oh, I didn't, I, don't, I didn't know I needed to go to court. I didn't know I needed to show up for for trial. And yeah, so that's, that's what the warrants. Were. So you had two warrants out, yeah. and um, luckily, uh, Tiana, she's freaking squared away. Yeah, and she set up appointments for you yeah. with the New Jersey court. Yeah. And the New York court, she went there, put her ass on the line, as yeah, a matter of fact, and said, like, I vouch for this guy. Yeah. He wants to change his life. Yeah. He's had some rough steps. Yeah. He's going to go in the Navy yeah. if you can let him uh, If you can let him in, yeah. basically, is, where, just it, right is where it comes from. Yeah. Um, now, how long was it before you actually shipped out? Two weeks. Damn. That was June. How old were you? I'm 19. I turned 20 in boot camp. Turned twenty in boot camp. Yeah, twenty in boot camp, and the crazy thing about it is Tiana died two years later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a cool afterward in the yeah. book that you write yeah. about her and you find her yeah. and find her Don't family. Her. I was with her actually. Very with her, cool. Yeah, I was with her uh, her aunt and uncle. Yes, uh, two nights ago at the at the lip bar. So um, yeah, I'm I'm super close to the family, but yeah, she she changed the trajectory of my life. Yeah, and she did it. You know, you mentioned this in yeah. the afterward of the book, like and. Just shout out to her. She changed the trajectory of a lot of a lot of, yeah. a lot of young uh, yeah. men and women to yeah. get them in the military. And you know, sometimes people talk about recruiters, yeah. you know, and c- c- recruiters lie and yeah, all this stuff, which they do. Yeah. Um, but I'll tell you what, you know, when when they when they take someone that's on a negative trajectory yeah, yeah. and you get them in the navy yeah. or get them in the military, yeah. man, you're doing a huge favor to yeah. them. Yeah. A huge favor to them. Yeah. I can tell you right now, like best thing that ever happened to me was. Going in the going in the navy. One hundred percent. Um. So boot camp. You yeah. ship off to boot camp. Yeah. How's how's Remy young Remy like boot camp? Uh, it was easy. <laughs> it was ridiculously easy. Um, I I was motivated to be AJ squared away mm-hmm. because of the decision that Tiana made. I didn't want to, um, prove her decision wrong because there was a reason why the military didn't want me in mm-hmm. with my record, um, with my warrants and my background, mm-hmm. which, you know, I, in retrospect, I understand. And, and, I, and I knew that Tiana took a risk, and I knew that if I 
screwed up or if I talked back or if I was rude or if I didn't pay attention to detail, then I would just be proving, proving, you know, the system right, you know? Yeah. And so, uh, so boot camp was easy for me. It, uh, you know, I just did what I was told. Yeah. But every single day I was in boot camp, though, even in the, even when I got by the, when I got to the teams, I was petrified because I always had that thing hanging over me. That that the stuff that I did with the cell phones hanging over me, it's gonna come back. It's gonna bite me in the butt. So every I remember being in boot camp and when my name would get called, even if it was something as <laughs> simple as, hey, you know, I would, hey, get over here, Lake, and I go in. I'm like, oh crap, this yeah. is it. They shipping me out. <laughs> Uh, you know, I lied, moment of truth, all of this other stuff. Yeah, uh, you know, I was I was just petrified, and it'd be something as simple as, "Oh, we just want to confirm what your preference is on your dog tag." Like, oh. <laughs> like my heart just cut in, and I go back in. But that followed me, and that's one thing I learned. You know, when you do when you do wrong, and it it, it it sticks with you, it follows you, man, and and and, and for a long time. And yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. What you got to be careful too is sometimes you know people make mistakes. Yeah. And they think, well, I already made a mistake. So yeah. like you could easily have done that if you yeah. had a different mindset. Like, well, they'll never let me in. I'll yeah. never be able to make it. So yeah. I'll just keep doing bull, you know exactly. criminal shit. Yeah. Because I've already screwed up. Yeah. So luckily you didn't get that. I forgot to mention you didn't come in the Navy on a SEAL contract. No. Um, you. I don't think your ASVAB score was good enough. Nope, my, I couldn't swim. I and you couldn't swim. Score, yep. And I, was, <laughs> and I was skinny. I How barely, much did you weigh? I was like one forty-five, maybe mm-hmm. one fifty. I was, I was, I was skinny. I would wear baggy clothes and and you know present like I was large and in charge. But I was, a, I was always skinny. You said one forty-five. I was like one forty-five, one fifty. Damn. I was skinny. My did, brother was really skinny. My brother now is like still super skinny. Did you did, did you play any sports in high school? I played, <laughs> I played basketball, and then I got kicked off the team, and I never played again. Mm-hmm. I remember, I'll never forget it. Um, I was in my sophomore year, and somebody made a joke. The coach is standing there. Somebody made a joke. All of us laughed. The coach's eyes, for some reason, landed on me, and he said, "You think that was? You think that's funny?" And I was like, "Yeah, it's, it's funny." Not being aware that he was upset, and he said, "All right, you kicked off the team." And I was like, what? He's like, you kicked off the team. Get out of here. You still think that's funny? And I never played basketball ever again. Like, like in, in, in that type of capacity. It really screwed me up. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, like, and did you ever work out? Did you ever run? Did you ever do push-ups, any shit like that? All the stuff I did at Fordham Hill, you know, running around with the guys, playing two-hand touch football, mm-hmm. you know, kicking the door and running. Um, there was a, I remember in high school, I can't remember if it was my sophomore or junior year, but we had like a weightlifting class and I did that and I remember, you know, getting, you know, putting on muscle quick. That's something that I've never had an issue when I start working out. Like, I'll put on muscle quick and I lose it fast if I don't maintain it. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, other than that, yeah, I, I didn't have like a set fitness regimen it's, it's good to hear because yeah. you know sometimes guys they think oh if i wasn't a freaking swimmer or football player or yeah. whatever wrestler then i don't have a chance of making it yeah. through buds when yeah. it's, it's actually not true yeah, yeah. It just depends yeah. on your mentality yeah but you should but you show up and you, did you get a contract to be a corpsman yeah i got okay. uh, yeah i was a corpsman yep so you go to boot camp you make it through the moment of truth um <laughs> which if you don't know moment of truth is when they like Tell you like we have all of your records, yeah. and if you don't come clean yeah. with what your records say, yeah. you're gonna be sent to federal prison yeah. for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> and then some kids break up. Like, I, yeah, I, yeah. I got caught for shoplifting in fourth grade, and you know. But uh, yeah. and but Tiana had told you, yeah, you keep your fucking mouth yeah, shut, shut, boy. Yeah, shut <laughs> up, man. Don't let them. Don't get, come on. You're in New York. Yeah. And don't fall for the okey doke. Yeah. And I didn't. <laughs> and I, did it. I was scared. I almost yeah. did, but I did. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So you get that. You get you get through boot camp. Mm-hmm. You get through uh, HM school. Yeah. So you're going to become a, if you don't know what a corpsman is, yeah. it's a medic in the yeah. navy. Yeah. And then you get stationed at Camp Pendleton. Yeah. At the at the hospital. What year is this? This is 2000. I got to the hospital in 2003. 2003. Yeah. Um, you show up there. You, and again, this is like great stuff in the yeah. book, funny stuff in the yeah. book. You get some, your interaction with some yeah. of the fleet people that yeah. are showing up and yeah. treat you like shit, yeah, man. Uh, which is terrible. Um, but you know you want to go to Bud's. Yeah, yeah. You get the 
you get the DVD of the documentary yeah. for uh, the class 234 documentary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And again, you don't really know much about working out. Yeah. So you just make up your own workouts. I just make it up. <laughs> I just see, all right, I watch a documentary and I see, all right, these dudes are just constantly moving. They're mm-hmm. just going from the pull-up bar to push-ups to the surf zone and back. So I can't work out where I'm going to sit down, bench, get up, you know, ch- sit, bench, mm-hmm. sit, you know, just chill. I need to be constantly moving. So that's what I did. That I, I, I remember having a logbook where I just, you know, the first part of my workout was uh, where I had to max out. You know, I had to was my test. So if it was a pull up workout, then that, that was when I would try and get the most pull ups that I could get, and I would log it. So on, you know, two twenty three, two thousand and three, like five pull ups. Then you know, the next week when I did that workout, I had to at least hit mm-hmm. six pull ups, and I just gradually just started creating circuits around that. Seemed like you're pretty methodical. Yeah, there's yeah. something about your nature that's methodical. I think it comes from my dad, you know, being an engineer yeah, or whatever. Being an engineer and having that engineering mind, you know, even now as a filmmaker and, you know, whether it's doing an organ harvesting film or an action thriller or, you know, a drama, like in my mind, it's just, just piecing the story together in a way that an engineer pieces a, a building together or pieces a, a car together. It's just like I, I just I see the problem and my mind just starts trying to figure out how to work through that problem. Mm-hmm. That's how it how I worked out with, with fitness and trying yeah. to get in proper shape. And you do that with your ASVAB as well because you got to improve yep. your ASVAB score. Yep. So you figured out, and again, all the stuff is in the book. Read yeah, the book because yeah. it shows when you take a methodical approach to things, you can you can get through them. Yeah. Uh, you also do some dumb shit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like you've got this one uh, like second class, maybe she's yeah. an HM2 or an HM3 and she like, doesn't yeah. like you. Yeah, is that her real name? No. Oh, okay. I can tell you her real uh, name. No, don't tell me. I don't, want, I, don't want, I don't want this girl to get yeah, hate, yeah, hate mail from around the world. Yeah. But yeah, you got like a, a third, third class? Third class, yeah. yeah and she yeah. like doesn't like you hates and me, she man. just hates you. Yeah. And then you got a situation where you're the duty driver, yeah. meaning you need to be on call to drive if needed. Yeah. And you'd done it a bunch of times, you'd never been called called. before. And so she tells you, you know, you're duty driver, you better not leave base. And yeah. you're like, okay. And sure enough, one of your buddies is some new freaking that tears of the sun, bro. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you, could, you couldn't resist I it. I couldn't dude. resist, man. Opening weekend. I wanted to see uh, tears of the sun, dude. <laughs> uh yeah. So you so you go and see yeah. it, you get in trouble. Again, all the stuff is in the book. These yeah. are all great little uh stories from yeah. the book as well. Yeah. But you end up getting through that yeah. and you get you get in 2004, yeah. you get you get orders to Buds. Yeah, get orders um, to Buds, man. Yeah. What's your first impression when you show up at Buds? Oh, it was like shock and awe, bro. But it was also like, wow, this is where I'm supposed to be. Um, there were times where I was just like, man, can they do this to you? <laughs> like I was <laughs> like, what the heck? And I remember uh, one instructor, I can't remember his name. I won't, so I probably couldn't say his name anyway, but he was like, we were getting hammered. Um, uh, during an inspection with our uniform and my pants were had sagged down like past my butt and my boots were on like, what you doing boy you think this is the hood and I looked up I'm like can you say that to me <laughs> and then you realize it's all a mind game they all mess with you but yeah it was just it was like a, a beautiful world man that I had never been in and then also the caliber of guys that you know that that I was around. You know they they would just, I had never been a, and this is like the cream of the crop as it relates to Americans. Mikey Monsoor was in my boat yeah. crew. Ray Bobbier was in my class. And Brian Joe rolled into roll into our class. It was like all of these really really good dudes and guys who would go on to be legends. You know in our community. And so just to be a kid from the hood, like here, there were times when I was like. Do I even belong here? <laughs> like, are they gonna find out that like I shouldn't be here for some reason? And but it was, I was happy mm-hmm. every day. I was just, I was just happy to be there. How you old know? are you now at this point when you showed up? Let's see, that's two. Th- I might have been twenty one. I should have. No, I was twenty one for sure because I turned twenty in boot camp. Went through to January. I started in January of two thousand and four. So I was yeah, I was twenty one. Okay. Yeah, I would. I turned twenty two in um, that upcoming August of two thousand and four. <clears throat> you give a good description here. Yeah. 
you say this master chief picked up the megaphone and said this is just the first hour of training and you clowns are falling apart you want to waste my the waste the time of our instructor staff well i'm going to waste your time go line up on the beach we all scurried down to the beach and lined up side by side with our backs to the ocean the medical truck drove through a break in the berm and flashed its high beams on us then the instructor slowly walked over the berm and down to where we stood in silent anticipation the temperature was still around 55 degrees and there was a slight breeze because of my lack of body fat and wet clothes i was already shaking to make matters worse i knew exactly what was coming next an evolution called surf torture through the megaphone master chief gave the command about face we all turned around to face the ocean lock arms <laughs> i can't help but smile when i hear this <laughs> we all know what yeah. this means uh we interlocked arms forward march as a class we began to w- make our way into the ocean the water temperature in San Diego in February hovers around 57 degrees. In layman's terms, that's freezing cold. I'd already been in the water, but it was a quick in and out. Now I was slowly walking in, and the only way I could stop was if I unlocked arms and turned to quit. The water got up to my ankles. I said, damn, that's cold, but I kept moving. Then the water was at my thighs, then hips, and finally the water reached my abdomen. Master Chief said, and halt. We all stopped and stood there as the waves splashed on us. I remember trying to stand on my toes to keep as much of my upper body out of the water as possible. Then I heard the command, take seats. We all slowly got in the sitting position. I could hear all kinds of cursing from the guys up and down the line. Our upper bodies were now submerged and when the waves crashed over us, our faces would be submerged as well. I quickly learned that I could take name calling. Growing up in the hill prepared me for that. The sprints and push-ups, my training at the hospital prepared me for that. And everything else they threw at me. But the cold was my kryptonite. My body wasn't built for it. After 15 minutes of lying there shaking like a coconut on a tree, I heard the infamous ding, ding, ding again. The instructors had brought the bell to the beach and another student had quit. That's buds, man. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, so what you, you figure your body fat was super low. Done. And you I, were had just no, I had zero body fat. I mean, every surf torture, even at the end of every two mile time swim, I was either borderline hyperthermic, hyperthermic, <laughs> just because it's like, especially being in winter, you mm-hmm. know, it was just like, ah, you, so you had, you also had some problems with swimming with fins. You'd yeah. never swam with fins never before. Swam. Yeah. I didn't know that. I thought that I, when you, when I took the screening test, I thought that I just had to learn how to do the 500 mm-hmm. to get in. <laughs> I didn't know that I actually had to swim with fins and buds. Uh-huh. I saw it in, I saw it in, in the buds two, three, four, but I didn't know that it was like time. I thought, oh, you just get in. And, Cause I saw the base women, um, when the guy is that famous base swim scene. Oh, the guy's typing out a little bit. Yeah, it's just completion, completion. I, I always thought completion, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, man, that's that was my that was also my crypto. <laughs> <laughs> so you you kind of got through that. The cold is an is a freaking issue for you. You yeah. talk about doing these swims, and by yeah. the time you get done with the swims, just about every time you're. Um, yeah. You're not doing good. Nah, two oh. hours, like two hours. Instructors will always mess with me, saying, "Well, saying, hey, dude, are oh, we gonna have to bring a, D, a, a tape player and DVD <laughs> on this boat with us on the safety <laughs> boat? Because two hours, because the swim, the passing time was eighty five minutes, and I'm out there for two hours, and they were they were they were intentionally making me finish it because they were like, nah, we're gonna let him suffer until he quits. You." <laughs> Again, there's a co- bunch of good stories about this yeah. stuff in the book. But, the, for instance, at, at Steel, so now we get to Hell Week. Yeah. In Hell Week, at Steel Pier, yeah. you you start to hype out. Yeah. And yeah. who's your your body temperature was like 87 degrees. Yeah, 88, yeah I think it was 88.7. 88.7 yeah, 88. degrees. That's 7. not a good sign. No. So you you got hypothermia. Yeah. Um, They take you out of the water. They bring you to medical. Yeah. They warm you up. Yeah. Uh. Which I didn't even know they did this. Yeah. So they would take you out of the water, they warm you up, yeah. and now they, what, like an hour or something like that, yeah. get your core temperature yeah. back up. The thing is, man, Buds is psycho, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, it, but it's actually fair. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. And you're a good example of that. Yeah, yeah. And this is, your whole story is a good example yeah. of the fact that, like, that right there. Yeah. It, if you quit because you're cold, you're a quitter. Yeah. But if you hype out, there's only so much you can do about <laughs> yeah. that as a human. Yeah. Like, you know, you you some people they just don't have uh well, number one, they don't have the body fat. Yeah. If you were probably like this freaking 
skinny yeah. 160 pound or 150 pound kid yeah. you don't have body fat nah, nah. you're gonna be freaking chilly yeah, yeah. like even we have a joke in the teams we call it when someone's a little chubby they call it combat swimmer muscle yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's like hey i could stay warm for a long time yeah so it's a real thing yeah yeah and so when, when you got a guy that like gets hypothermic it's to steel pier echo charles what it is is there's a there's a pier over in the san diego bay mm-hmm. on the on the Navy base, it's made of steel. Yeah. Steel is not warm, by the way. <laughs> so it's Steel Pier, and it's usually, I think it's the first night of Hell Week. It's maybe like two or three o'clock in the morning. It might be the it second w- night of Hell it Week. It was the second night of Hell Week, yeah. Because yeah. we did the uh, elephant run down to, uh, it, it may have even been the third night, because we did the elephant run with the uh, boats on heads mm-hmm. from Buds down to Imperial Beach. Mm-hmm. We were down there for a while. Mm-hmm. Daybreak comes, and then, we do some stuff down there, and then maybe it was that night we had yeah. to. I, the, it's it has to be yeah. one of the first two nights because yeah. by the third night you would you would just be like not not into it, yeah. not not able to do it. Yeah. But they put you, they basically put you on the steel pier. It's freezing cold, and then they put you in the water, and they bring you out. They're spraying you with cold hoses, and they make you lay down on the steel pier, and then stand up with the wind blowing. And yeah. they're just they're just gonna get people to hype out. They're gonna yeah. get you cold. Uh, so you hyped yeah. out, yeah. they take you away, they warm you up. How'd you feel? Because then they're bringing you back. Yeah, yeah. And this is what? This is Dale Fort, Chief Fortin, right? Yeah, bringing Fort, you back. Yeah, what yeah, was he yeah, saying yeah. to you, dude? Oh, wow. He was funny, man. You know, he was just like, so uh, <laughs> you want to quit or you want to go back? You want to go back in? And I was like, oh, yeah, I'll go back in. He's like, all right, good on you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that's your mindset. Like, yeah. you're freezing cold. Yeah. Then they go, okay, yep. Yeah. We warmed you back up. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, buds is fair. Yeah. You're warm now. Yeah. Go back in. <laughs> go back. But and they didn't know in their defense, they didn't know I was sick. Oh, that's right. They didn't you know that covered had, up the yeah, fact that you had sight. Yeah, I started with sight. I was spitting up blood. And mm-hmm. so, um, you know, none of the instructors knew. Cause I because for me it was just like, dude, I don't want to freaking go to this med check, that med check before hell week, they find out that I have sight and I'm spitting up blood and then I have to start day one of first phase all yeah. over again. So I'd rather, you know, get, go for at least it. get to Wednesday. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> hell week to get real for it. You go back to the class here. I'm going to pick it up in the book. Yeah. The short rest had helped. I wasn't feeling great by any means, but I was feeling good enough to manage. About 30 minutes later, my lungs felt like I was breathing through a kitty straw. Yeah. I started to feel dizzy from lack of oxygen, and before I knew it, I'd fallen to the ground. I was still conscious when the instructors were on me like blood-drunk hyenas. Get up, you quitter. There's nothing wrong with you, Instructor G said as I stumbled my way to my feet and began to stagger behind my boat crew. Medical cleared you, so stop faking it and get under the boat. I mustered the last ounce of strength in my body. After about 30 seconds, I caught up to my boat crew, stood erect with my head under the boat, and kept driving. Despite my lack of Despite being back in position, the instructors didn't care. They wanted me gone. Three instructors ran beside me shouting all kinds of stuff. Drama queen, weak, (laughs) loser. And then just like that, in the midst of the chaos, chaos, everything went black. I can't tell you exactly what happened, but before when I was told, later, every part of my body stopped moving at the same time. My arms fell down to my side, and and like a leaning tower that has passed the point of no return, I face-planted into the concrete. One student described it like seeing a robot powered down in mid-flight. The instructors flipped my motionless body over and tried to bring me back to consciousness. After two minutes, one of the instructors did a deep sternum rub, which led my nerves to shock me awake. When my eyes opened, everything seemed hazy. I could see instructors running to me and the ambu pulling up. I remember coughing violently. I felt like my lungs were full of dust. The medical team loaded me back in the ambu and raced me back to medical. I kept going in and out of consciousness. I couldn't feel anything hot, cold, or pain. Am I dying, I thought. If I am, it's not as bad as I thought it would be. It seemed kind of like a peaceful slipping away. As soon as we got to Bud's medical, Dr. Ryan listened to my lungs. All he could say was, oh my, that's not good. A civilian ambulance was called, and I was rushed to Balboa Hospital with sirens and lights blazing. My self-diagnosis turned out to be correct. And I skipped this part, but we yeah, mentioned it. You had, you knew as a corpsman that yeah. you had some, some uh, swimmer-induced pulmonary edema. You had fluid in your lungs. Yeah. X-rays showed that my lungs were filled with fluid. I was sub- subsequently diagnosed with sype, pneumonia, and another poten- potentially fatal condition, rhabdomyolysis. There was no way I could return to Hell Week. Instead, I spent two days in the ICU and three more days in general recovery. So that's your first crack at Hell Week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> didn't go good. Yeah, it didn't go too well. <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't quit. Nah, yeah. And, and yeah. like I said, yeah, man. Bud's is hard, yeah. but it's fair. Yeah, it's fair. And that's why if you meet someone and they kind of like blame 
Yeah, yeah. You bro. know, <laughs> it, it, there's a there's a really good chance. Yeah. That they're they're not being honest with you, 100. and they're probably not being honest with themselves yeah, as well. 100%. Uh, my my friend and f- former Admiral McGuire used to tell the guys yeah. before Hell Week, yeah. if you don't make it through, it's because of you. Yeah, that's true. And again, you're a good example of that because yeah. here you are, you hyped out. Yeah, they warm you up. They yeah. let you restart with the class. Yeah. Now you freaking pass out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> pass out while running, and. They don't drop you. Yeah. You didn't quit. Yeah. So they put you back to first day of first day phase again. What I didn't want to happen happened oh. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so and I, and, I, uh, and, and I met Mark Lee. Mark, oh, there you go. Mark Lee was in my boat crew. Oh, yeah, because you, yeah. you had Mikey yep. was in 250. Yep. And then... And then Mark was in 251, yeah. right on. Yeah. He was in your boat crew? Yeah, we were in the same boat crew. Was, Mike, he, yeah, was he a freaking character? He, dude, no, he was so humble. He got on me one time because you know how it is. You get, well, I'm sure you don't because you, you're <laughs> way better man than I could ever be. But, you know, I got my chest popped out a little bit more because of the fact that I made it through the first phase the first time, got to hell week. Um, and then here I am, this kid from the Bronx. So my head just got big, and I remember just walking around. And I remember Mark Lee. We were in front of um, our barracks, six hundred two, and lined up in our boat crew. And I looked over after talking to Master Chief, the Master Chief of First Phase. Won't mention his last name, and uh, you know, because he you know, Master Chief was joking with me about something, and so I had my chest. Oh, the instructor's joking with me, being buddy buddy. So I walk back over, my chest is out, and I look out the corner of my eye, and Mark Lee's just looking at me. And I look over, I'm like, what are you looking at, man? And he's like, you need to be humble. Dang. Yeah. And I, and I remember it bothered me. And it wasn't until, like, we got close to the Hell Week that I really understood what he was saying. And we became really, really cool. But he checked me because he saw where my head was going. Mm-hmm. And, he, and he said, hey, if you, if you keep this up, he was pretty much saying, if you keep this up, they're going to kick you out. Don't, don't let their kindness fool you, you know, just because you had a, a, a run. So... I'll never forget that. Mm-hmm. I'll never forget him checking me. What about Mikey? Do you remember Mikey? Yeah. I, I will never forget after I got, he made it through Hell Week and I got back, he came up to me. Mm-hmm. And he was like, because I think, I can't remember if he had been in Buds before he or something. Had both Mark okay. and Mikey okay. had both been to Buds before they were w- with yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. both quit. Okay. So Mikey came up to me. He's like, put his hand on my shoulder he's like dude I understand bro like it's all right you'll get back in and mm-hmm. keep your head in the game and I'll never forget that comfort that he gave me because I was crushed when I came back from the hospital so all of them with their brown shirts on and they're like yeah twos and it's you know the the, the yell that we do mm-hmm. after we get a call out and he came up to me and comforted me mm-hmm. and I'll never forget that he said something to me before we went into hell week that uh, I remember for a long time but I can't remember now. It was it was he was such a humble dude. He was, man. He was like a humble, good, good dude, man. You know what I mean? That was the one thing I remember about Mikey. And even when we were in boat crew and everything, we when we were in like in surf tour show to run with boats on our heads or whatever the case may be, workman was in our boat crew as well. Mm-hmm. You know, he would just always be positive. Mm-hmm. It was almost like he was the leader of the crew and very selfless, you know, and obviously we know what, what happened, but that's what I remember. But I'll never forget him coming up to me after I got released from the hospital. Mm-hmm. And that gave me that conversation that he had with me, gave me that spark to keep going. Because, you know, I never the idea of quitting never really crossed my mind, but I was down hard, you know, seeing my brothers moving on. And and yeah, so I'll never forget that for sure. Awesome freaking guys, yeah, man. Yeah. Um, so you start up again and won one day. Yeah. So you've done what? Four weeks of training. Yeah. Four weeks of. <laughs> four weeks of just freaking circus games, yeah, bro. Yeah. And you go all the way back to the yeah. beginning. This time you're, you, you do good, right? Yeah. You, you make it through Hell Week. Yeah. Um, once you make it through Hell Week, these the instructors yeah. realize that you sucked at swimming. Yeah, man. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and you had just barely gotten yeah. past every swim. And so they actually, when you get done with Hell Week, and this happens 
pretty normal, pretty yeah. regularly. People get you to get done with Hell Week, and you're just yeah. done. Like yeah. you're you're injured. Yeah, yeah. You basically make can be any kind of injury. Yeah. But like you get rolled. Yeah. Happens to a lot of guys after Hell Week. You, so you get rolled, but they actually roll you for two classes. Two classes. I'll never forget when I'm running off the beach. Hell Week just secured. Mass Chief Hoffman, God rest his soul. Mm-hmm. Commander Zinke and uh, Captain uh, Smithers. You know they, uh, they they. I'm about to run through that gate. You know from the beach into mm-hmm. the compound. And like Adelaide, you come here. And Mass Chief was like, "Yo." You ain't moving forward. <laughs> He's like, yo, we think you they, we think you're a good dude and you got potential, but we got it. Now we're gonna teach you how to swim. <laughs> Cause yeah. we, you proved that you wanna be here. Yeah. So now we're gonna teach you how to swim. And uh yeah, man. Start started uh when the rollback land. Yeah, they, they do like even that right there, you can tell they didn't want to invest in you before yeah. Hell Week yeah. because then you take a bunch of time, put yeah. it into a guy, and he just quits anyways. And yeah. You never know who's going to quit. Yeah, yeah. You just never know. Yeah. Someone might seem like a, quote, good dude yeah. and then Steel Pier. Yeah, man. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Steel Pier comes yeah. around, boy. Those yeah. things, those, cool, those good dudes, they, yeah. they start having a different opinion about things, yeah. about what they want to do with life. Yeah, man. You know, they start having those things happen. Yeah. So you you get rolled, even though you learned how to swim. So now you class back up again. Yeah. You still fail swims because yeah. the time tightens up. The time tightens but it was, it was my pride. I mean, uh, that conversation that um, uh, Mark Lee had with me, Time had passed, and I didn't. And he, and another thing about Mark, he was always holding me accountable throughout that whole process of us going through first phase in the Hell Week. Sometimes it was just a look, mm-hmm. like Laker, you're getting, you're getting a little ahead of yourself, right? And I didn't have that accountability anymore. And when I was in rollback land, I had a lot of time on my hands. Mm-hmm. And so after we we would get off at like twelve o'clock, we just have to do our swim PT, and then I'm out. Hanging out, going downtown, doing all of these stupid things. And then on the weekends, it was party time. Mm-hmm. And right after I passed my first swim in first phase, it was on. I was just like, I'm making it through buds because mm-hmm. now I'm going to die phase. Nobody can't tell me anything. And the instructors would show up on the weekends to um, help. To help anybody with anything this is post hell week you know whether you were struggling with swims even if you were struggling with runs if you're struggling with any if you if you anticipate anticipated that you would be struggling with anything dive related they would show up on the weekends at like eight o'clock in the morning a reasonable time mm-hmm. nothing too crazy work with guys for a couple hours and then go and i i never showed up mm-hmm. because i'm too busy partying in the gas lamp district and chasing girls and doing all the stupidity that I'm too hung over to, you know, to yeah. show up. Part of the test of buds yeah. is the weekends. Yeah. yeah. And it's yeah. part of the test. Like, yeah. people are always surprised. Like, yeah. no, you don't have every weekend off and you don't, you definitely don't have, you definitely don't have every weekend off and yeah. you definitely have things to do on the weekend. Yeah. But if you want to go down to the gas lamp district and yeah. get drunk yeah. and, and be stupid, yeah. you can do it. Yeah. But it's going to catch up with you. Yeah. And and that is part, and not to mention get just getting in trouble, getting yeah. arrested, getting whatever rolled up for whatever thing. So yeah. that they're kind of looking to see how mature you are yeah. if you can handle that. Yeah. So you have the opportunity to ch- train, but you you passed one swim and you're like, oh, I'm good to I'm go. Good to go. <laughs> you you even have the book in the book, and I forget which part it is, but <laughs> it's like cardinal sin. Like some girl out in the bar asks you what you do, and you're like, I'm a, I'm a Navy SEAL. Yeah. And like, as you said it, you're like, oh, wait a second. I have said that. That's like a cardinal sin, I dude. Know. And I wanted to be honest, you know what I mean? Like, and that was one thing in a book. I wanted to be honest about, you know, because it's good to show all the glamorous things and all that other stuff, but I wanted to show I was, I was in a bad place. And it was all my, it was all on me. And I wanted people to see the mistakes that I made and see, hey, I even, Told foolish lies like the, that. Fuck the cardinal sin, bro. <laughs> yeah. Don't say your. Don't say it, man. Yeah. <laughs> don't say it. You could say I'm a trainee. Yeah. You know, there's all kinds of things you could say, but he said it. Yeah. <laughs> and thankfully, no one was there to hear it, yeah. other than this yeah. poor girl yeah. who was getting lied to. By the way. So you so, so you get so now you get back into class. You're in yeah. second phase, yeah. which is dive phase. Yeah. You fail the first swim. I fail the first swim. Fail the second swim. And then you fail the second swim. Yeah. 
and then there's an area of training uh it's i guess it's called pool week yeah and you're now this is when you're actually learning to dive yeah. with with uh with like open circuit yeah. diving which is like regular scuba diving yeah. and you have a bunch of protocols and tests to go through with that yeah. and you you actually are passing these tests yeah. but there's another test yeah. called the tread yeah <laughs> tell us about the tread the tread is five minutes treading water hands above the water um, as soon as your hands touch the water you fail uh, 280s on your back tanks full dive gear weight belt on you're just using your fins and I'm a dude that already struggled with the swims. <laughs> <laughs> so you had that. And, and you know, for some people, like Ryan Job, I know he had no issue with it. No, because he, he could float. Yeah, dude. he was just. A, a, <laughs> yep. But for me, I'm already negative, no body fat, jump in the water, I go down anyway. With that, it's like I'm drowning. As a matter of fact, when I did. Um, uh, drown proofing in first phase, and part of part of drown proofing is a float. I didn't float. I had I was literally kicking the entire time because I'm so negative. So multiply that with with uh, the dive tanks and the tread, and that was horrific. I mean, for me, it was it was like I felt like I was drowning, and I failed that four times. And again, here was an evolution that the instructors would show up on a weekend because they knew it was coming. If you want to learn some techniques or you know some ways to, to pass this, show up and we'll help you. And I wasn't there. So you failed the tread yep. four times. Yeah. Um, you end up at going to a, a board yeah. to see what they're going to do with you. And I'm going to take it to the book here. Yeah. Adelaide, come in. Commander O said. I replied, "Who ya?" Before stepping into the room and standing at attention, Commander O asked, "Adelaide, you've been here for a year, haven't you?" Hooya, sir, I replied. He continued, well, because of your length of time here, I'm sure you understand what's about to happen. Hooya, I replied again. Then the command master chief chimed in. Edeleke, listen, you've been rolled three times, once for medical, and the command decided to give you a double roll for swims. Hooya, master chief. Looking down on my record, master chief continued, after being double rolled for swims, you failed both your swims in second phase, and one of those failing times didn't even meet the first phase standard. So you got worse. Yeah. You swam 86 minutes. After reading through my stats, he looked up at me for a response. Hoo no excuse, Master Chief, I failed. I said, trying to keep it short. Lieutenant B read me my rights. Because of your triple rolls, your failure to meet the swim standard, and this week's pool week failures, you've shown us that you don't have what it takes to be a SEAL, I, we hereby performance drop you from buds. You must immediately return your training gear in and report to X division. The command career counselor will talk with your detailer and you will re-enter the general Navy. Hoo sir, I replied respective, respectfully. The commander asked, do you have anything to say, Adelaide? Yes, sir, I want to thank you for all the countless opportunities that you have given me to succeed. When I look at what has transpired over the last year, I can't blame anyone but myself. I made sure to scan the entire room as I delivered my parting words. I showed up unprepared, and when I had the opportunity to get remediation on the weekends, I didn't show up. My goal moving forward is to learn from my mistakes and come back 10 times better. In retrospect, that was the first time in my adult life I remember taking responsibility for my actions. In the past, my failures were always somebody else's fault. But finally, I took a stand and pointed the finger at my own chest. Master Chief concluded, dismissed Adelaide. Hoo ya, I replied. Then I did an about face and walked out of the conference room through the quarter deck and out to the grinder. As I walked across the grinder, I stared down the big uh, be someone special sign and then made my way to the barracks to move out. Yeah. <sighs> Damn, dude. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was good. I, it was necessary. You know, mm-hmm. I look back on my life, certain things that happened to me, even with, you know, looking back on my dad and what happened to him and coming to America. Um, I wouldn't be who I am without what happened to my mm-hmm. dad. I know it sounds crazy. And um, I wouldn't be who I am without having learned that lesson, without having taken responsibility. Um, I needed that to happen. I wasn't ready. And I know for unequivocal doubt that if I would have made it through and, you know, went on with with Mikey and those guys and, and to the teams and all that, I would have been an out of control monster. And going back to Mark, Mark saw that. Mm-hmm. And that's what Mark was trying to rectify in me, 
you know, throughout our time in first phase in the hell week because he saw what I would potentially become if I got to the team. So that moment was necessary, me getting kicked out, but even more so me getting that lesson. Extreme ownership. Mm-hmm. You take responsibility for your actions. You can't grow. I don't think – there's no way I could have grown without looking in the mirror at that point and saying it's your fault. Yeah. I mean, that's <sighs> – did you, at that moment, truly think, like, I'm going to get better and I'm going to come back? I, I didn't know if I was going to get the opportunity to come back. Yeah. But I knew that if I did, I would be ready. Mm-hmm. You know, Because it's not – now, look, this is, this is like the war's going on. So yeah. at this time, at this juncture, there was a better opportunity of coming back yeah. than there is, like, today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Today, if guys don't make it, like, they're not going back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's definitely – even here, I mean, you got to do all kinds of things to get back. Yeah, yeah. You know, you got to get approval. You got to spend a couple years out in the fleet. Like, yeah. it is no easy task yeah. to get back. Yeah. This conversation was like a nightmare. Even when I read it, <laughs> I read it in your book. It like, it like, like turned my stomach. Yeah. You know, even I can just remember. You know, because you're always facing something. For me, when I was going through buds, like I was, I was never that great at anything. Yeah. yeah. So. On any day, yeah. I kind of could fail something. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I would pass, but yeah. like if I tripped on a run or something, yeah. or I, you know, whatever, f- dropped the fin on a swim and had to go yeah. back and find her, something like that. Yeah. Or, or you know, like those kind of little things could yeah. trip me up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was was paranoid. You yeah. know, I was yeah. paranoid. Yeah. And reading this thing, and and I looked at it like, <laughs> man, if you don't make it through. This time, I don't know what's going to be like. I yeah. couldn't even imagine going to the fleet and coming back. Yeah. Like, you took that like a champ, bro. <laughs> yeah. you, you took that like a champ. It was humbling, man. I, this, if I wrote this chapter, it would have been like, so then I was crying. And I, <laughs> fell, I fell on the floor, and I begged them for mercy and told them I'd never be a bad person again. And Because, uh, yeah, man. And But that being said, it. it you really didn't have a leg to stand on. I didn't. You, you failed. <laughs> they gave you two rolls, and you failed two swims, yep. and you failed. You even didn't make the first phase time, yeah. and then you failed four yeah. treads. And in my engineering mind, you know, my dad's mind, you know, is always trying to figure out a way mm-hmm. to like fix the problem or get around it. In my like, my mind saw this problem. Like, there is no computing here. <laughs> there is no working your way back into this right now. Yeah. You got to go away. And I bet whatever they write on your like uh, record. Yeah, yeah. I bet if you went in there like, well, you know, I didn't get this and yeah. I didn't get. They'd probably been like, don't let this guy return. Yeah. But like you said, you took ownership. Yeah. Hey, this is my fault. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunities. They, yeah. we, you, I clearly, you gave me a bunch of opportunities. Yeah. They probably said, hey, you know what? He's got a good attitude. Yeah. If he wants to come back, let's let him come back. Case in point, um, uh, Senior Chief Hitchcock gave me a, a recommendation letter right after that. Mm-hmm. He, when I was walking across the grinder, I, I a lot of this is cut out because my publisher was like, uh, you mm-hmm. didn't want it to be a shorter book, so so much is truncated and cut out. But when I, uh, right before I got off the grinder, Senior Chief Hitchcock was like, come in, like, one of these, like, dude, like, here's, a, as a matter of fact, I ended up going to Swick. That's a, that. That's the all out. That's not even in the book. That's not in the book. So 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 so. Afterwards, he Hitchcock pulled me aside and like two other instructors. Like, yo, dude, we want to k- kind of keep you in the community. Mm-hmm. Um, um, what, maybe you should consider going to Swick, and then and then coming back and going to Buds. So you went to Swick. So I went to Swick. How'd that go? I was in. I was in training. Well, I got put back in Brown Brownshirt Rollback Land, and then I was in training for maybe like a week, and I was like, this ain't for me, man. Nothing against it. This mm-hmm. is just not for me. Mm-hmm. And I uh, uh, went back to ARB board, and I was like, and, and my, the proctor, I can't remember his name, bad with names, but he was super cool, and he told the uh it was a seal i can't remember that dude's name but he was a seal he was the ops guy in charge mm-hmm. of both classes and he was like listen remy wants to be a he wants to be a seal and you know we know he can make it through his wig but mm-hmm. this this is not what he wants and then i went to first marine <laughs> damn dude. yeah so it was more to, and then and then hitchcock gave me the wrote me the letter got and it said hey come back 
we recommend that you come back in a year. So now you go to uh, First Battalion, Fourth Marines. Yeah, one four. You're you're a medic. Yeah, a uh, corpsman. Doc. Yeah. Uh, you go on deployment. Yeah. yeah. On the USS Peleliu. Yep. Yep. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Um, you do a PACOM deployment. So yeah. You're sailing around. Went to Asia. Kuwait. Yeah. Oh, then you went to Kuwait. Yeah. Yeah. We 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 were, well, we were just gonna do the PACOM thing, and then I get the guest report came in. Hey, mm. the, the our sister battalion was getting taking heavy losses, and so they needed us to come in and and reinforce. The, the the command battalion mm-hmm. whatever it was so the Peleliu pulled into Kuwait we all offloaded and moved to the Iraqi border so this month, what year was that deployment this was 2005 okay. 2005 yeah <clears throat> and um you know we sat there every day they like hey you guys are gonna go in you're gonna go in and then finally like after three months they said hey we're just gonna we I guess I got another battalion whatever mm-hmm. so then we just loaded back on the pedal and sail back to California so no Iraq for you on that deployment yeah, yeah. um and there, again there's all kinds of good information in here but yeah. there, you 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 have some bad luck in your life you also have some good luck in your life because yeah, it turns out that a guy named HM1 Roscoe yeah, Roscoe yeah, yeah, is Roscoe, that Roscoe yeah, yeah. Roscoe yeah he's one of your buddies yeah, yeah, yeah. and he gets assigned he was my LPO he was your LPO yeah. your leading petty officer and he gets assigned at the at the division HQ yeah, to yeah. sort of control yeah. where all the corpsmen are going to go. Yeah, and he knows you want to go back to buds. Yep. And so instead of spending over two years in the fleet, yeah, you spend what like a year in the fleet? A year, like a year and change, a couple <sighs> months. Yeah. And he gets you orders back to buds. Gets me back to buds. Yeah. Um. You go back to buds yeah. again. This this stuff is all. Yeah. You give you give a lot of good stories, some funny stuff. <laughs> yeah. You end up now. You're in class two sixty six. Yep. How's your attitude coming back this time? Squared away. Kept. Yeah. I was. I was. You respect. ain't playing no more. Nah. <laughs> I already. Know. I already got my. I already got my pee pee slap, bro. It's yeah. like I ain't gonna <laughs> have happen again. I was AJ squared away, quiet, helpful team. I was a team team player. Is it you know weird? Mean? Going to buds when you have a pretty clear idea of like what's going to happen, it's easier because you know everything that's going to happen. Yeah. So when the instructor's like, "We're going to keep you in the water for another thirty minutes," and guys start quitting, and just like, <laughs> "Yeah, I ain't keeping this." In <laughs> like Hell Week is going to go until Saturday, you know, because it ends on Friday. <laughs> yeah, typically ends on Friday. It's like I ain't going until Saturday. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you in my mind, I already kind of knew when things were going to end, even evolutions, like beatdown sessions, I kind of like, in my mind, knew when it was going to happen. Yeah. So. <laughs> I I, uh, I knew nothing about Buds. Yeah, yeah. I, like, knew nothing. Yeah. And I, we didn't know, I didn't know what pool comp was. Yeah, yeah. Like, I showed up and there was a poster. They had a Texas Chainsaw Massacre poster. Yeah. But they had changed it with, like, a Sharpie marker yeah. to put, like, a student down there yeah. <laughs> that was getting massacred. And it said, <laughs> Texas... Pool, no buds pool comp massacre <laughs> and the guy was like drowning and yeah. dying and i was like what i was like what is this that was my that was my first memory of buds i yeah. walked by medical and i saw i was like what is that yeah. what is the what are they doing so i didn't know anything so for me it was always just like i thought in the 30 second time frame you yeah. know like what am i doing right now is all i'm caring about yeah. it, it seems like knowing could go two ways yeah you know like if you know like yeah. oh gosh i got to do all this again yeah. Because I think some people quit because of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like when you got rolled back, yeah. sometimes people hear that one one day yeah, rollback and they yeah. go, nah, I'm not doing I'm this done. again. Yeah, yep. I ain't going through that again. So now you're going through and you know what's going to happen, but you kind of look, it kind of fell for a positive way for you. Yeah, I knew it was going to suck, but I knew I was prepared this time because I, swear, you know, the, the very next day after I left SWIC, I was in the pool, mm-hmm. you know, working on my swims. I was I, I created this exercise to strengthen my hip flexors and and my quads and and just all the muscles that needed to be strengthened for the tread, and I was I was good to go. I was AJ. I was locked in, and I didn't fail any swims in first phase. Hell week, good to go. Hell week, good to go. Kind of fun. Hell. Was it kind of fun? <laughs> I mean, it sucked. But I mean, it was <laughs> it was it wasn't like yeah, it was yeah, it was fun. I mean, um, in the sense that uh, I was able to enjoy it. Because <laughs> I wasn't so stressed out about can I make it? Am did you I try and eat? It? Did you try and put on weight? Did you try and fatten up at all? In the, for Hell Week? 
just in true. general, just uh, like going back to buds. I, no, I, I don't want to say that, dude. I, I want to mm. say because I, I, no matter what I what I do, even now to this day, I can't put on body fat. Like I like I, I try. Like I can't I eat a bunch of cheeseburgers, Popeyes, yeah. all that. You've got like, bad genetics. I just got bad, <laughs> terrible bad, genetics. Brutal, terrible man. genetics. Just, that Euroma <laughs> genetics. <man. laughs> you just can't be fat, dude. Yeah, What's wrong with you? Yeah. So, um, so no. it's all going good. Yeah. Um, until you get to your nemesis, the treads. Yeah, <laughs> the treads come again. Yeah, and you you fail them. You fail two of them. I'm going to go back to the well, book. Technically, here. technically you failed them. I failed them, but I passed. The, I passed the tread part of it. <laughs> you passed the tread part where you didn't pass the swim, but your thing popped off. Your tank yeah. popped off or something like yeah, that. Yeah. So for the first, I, 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 yeah. I don't what? Know you just, read it. Yeah. You, no. Oh, I thought you were about to read it. Yeah. Um, you failed the first one because I after after they called time for the five minute tread, I went swimming down, and then on my uh, and the strap was got loose and wrapped around my neck, but they I was still technically in it, and then I hit the wall, and when I came back, I was swimming and the strap was now around my neck, and then. I it fell off like right before I was about to touch the wall. Okay. So instructors call fail. So they say fail. Yep. Then what about the second one? Second one did the five minute tread, swim down on a, on my back on a on a on a swim back on the back. I have a shallow water blackout right after I pass oh. the second dive. Right after I pass the second dive tower. So there's that first small one and then not the, yeah the dive platform. The dive platform. Second uh, uh, dive platform. And so and then one day they all I, I didn't know what happened but. When they pulled me out of the water and got me on, revived me, they said that, uh, again, it's like somebody pulled a switch. <laughs> and, then the, and then the instructor looks at me, fail. It's like, dude, I thought I was like. And then the third time. Yeah. Well, yeah. so you failed the two. Yeah. And then and then I'm going to go to the book here. It says, at the end of the day, all the students who failed the tread were ordered to the Bud's quarter deck conference room for a board. The last time I was in that room, I was performance dropped and sent back to Camp Pendleton. I knew there was that wasn't going to happen today, but still, I didn't want to be anywhere near that place. The second phase, oh, I see, opened up the board. So you're all here because you failed to meet the minimum standard for the tread twice. This board is more of a warning than a final decision. If you fail the next two treads, you will stand before us in dress uniform, and we will determine whether you will be performance dropped or performance rolled. My advice to you, don't leave your fate in our hands. Go out there tomorrow and make the decision to continue with the rest of your class. Then senior chief went down the row of students asking each one of us if we attended the, if we had, had attended the optional weekend training. When he got to me, I said, hoo that's right, this time my weekends weren't for partying, for just, just for rest and any optional training offered. I had, my, I had learned my lesson. After all the instructors said their piece, all the students were dismissed except me. Senior Chief said, Adelaide, you've had some bad luck, haven't you? Hoo yeah, I replied. Listen, dude, we know you can do this. You pretty much passed twice, okay? But pretty much is not the standard here. <laughs> and we can't let you go on until you meet the standard. So just go out there tomorrow and get it over with so we continue with training. Okay? Hoo ya. I replied, dismissed. The next day I passed the buddy gear exchange with ease. Afterward, I went straight to passing area, sat down, faced the fence, and focused on meditating and breathing. I'd been so confident before the last two treads that I didn't do my spiritual teacher, I didn't do anything my spiritual teachers had taught me. And you got a bunch of stuff about how you were learning about meditation and stuff. I whispered to myself, calm Remy, in and out, in and out. I cleared all the negativity and noise out of my mind. I searched for peace within. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing. I'm like just trying to picture like yeah, how freaking okay. like f- how focused you had to yeah, be. Yeah, yeah. You're like tr- looking for peace within yeah. before the tread. <laughs> I found it. Stood up. Had my dive buddy help me don my tanks and waited for the evolution to start. Prepare to enter the water. Senior chief commanded. You are you are one with the water. <laughs> Hell yeah. Uh, you team, are man. you are one with each inhale and each exhale. Peace among the chaos, I declare. (laughs) I was in the zone, stone cold focused, jaw clenched and body still. End of the water. As soon as I hit the water, I popped it back to the top. I decided to keep my eyes closed this time to center my senses within. Everything I'd been taught was working. The five minute tread felt like two minutes time. Start your swim on your stomach. Upon the command, I opened my eyes and turned around with my hands still in the air. Once I saw the target, I slowly dipped my hands in the water and began to swim. Even though I was past the hardest part of the test, I didn't let go of my meditative state. I breathed in cadence with my mind. Mantra, peace, peace. 
peace, peace. <laughs> <laughs> I made it to the wall, spun around, kicked off, and started my flutter kick on my back. As I stared into the sky, I couldn't help but think of my pool sprint workouts. I did those workouts when, I, when it was cold, when it was raining, when the pool area was packed, when it was empty. I did it when I didn't want to do it, and I did it after the long drives up from back up from Pe- Camp Pendleton. I was staring at the same sky I had stared out in so many days and nights. It was full circle event for the first time since starting Buds. I finally felt gratitude to the universe for all that I had to go through to get to this point. Thank you for making me do this tread three times. Now I understand why I wouldn't have appreciated my journey if I had passed the first time. Thank you. When I touched the starting wall, I peacefully climbed out of the pool as I felt nothing had, as if nothing had happened. The calm that I had derived from my meditation was still lingering. Senior Chief yelled, Adelaide, pass. It's about damn time now. Drop down for taking so long to pass the tread. Hoo yah! With tanks on my back, I dropped to do push up, to do push ups. This time, as I stared at the ground with water dripping from my body, I knew it was over. I knew that despite having six more weeks of dive training and eight more weeks of third phase land navigation, weapons demolition, and tactics, nothing was going to stop me. I was going to gra- graduate. So. Yeah. You made it through that, yeah, through yeah. freaking peaceful meditation yeah, 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 and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hell, yeah. <laughs> classic, yeah, dude. It works, good. man. Oh, yeah. I felt it even yeah. reading that. I was like, yeah. oh, I kind of feel What's funny, peaceful. though, is like when I was reading it, I was kind of like, oh, yeah, it's cool. But then when I, when I actually started reading it out loud, I was like, this is kind of <laughs> kind of funny. <laughs> kind of funny. Like Especially it. if you were yeah. an instructor and, yeah. you, and you knew that was going on, yeah. they were like, they would have like, like got tore what apart. you doing, boy? Yeah. They would have freaking got on your ass, dude, for sure. Uh you make it through, man. Yeah. Um, you get rolled in 267 yeah, for yeah. land. What'd you do? Dude, I failed. A, a, it was stupid. It was like a demo test, man. Like, I, I, ju- I just screwed up the procedure. You know, I yeah. failed a demo test. I, I can't remember. I mean, this is like years ago. So, But it was like something with the demo. Some kind of demo procedure. Some you demo procedure. Ground yeah. yourself or yeah, something like this. Something. Boom. They, yeah. they roll you. Yeah. Yeah, dude, it ain't over, man. I know it ain't over. Know. Till, that's why I even like I, I never had the feeling in any of buds yeah. that I was gonna graduate yeah. until like I graduated, yeah. and even then I was a little worried. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I was like, wait a second, I, I could make it through this. Yeah. Um. Uh. By the way, this book, I'm I'm just reading like some some parts of this book, but you got like a whole up down relationship going yeah. on with this girl Cecilia. Yeah. yeah. Um. While you were, uh, you know, yeah. you're kind of going out with her. You're yeah. also kind of like still like a young player yeah. out getting after it. Yeah. Uh, you end up kind of you're in this like weird relationship with her where it's like I yeah. said, it's on and off again. She seems like even the way it started, like yeah. she had a different boyfriend. And you guys yeah. kind of got together, but then she went back with this other guy, and yeah. you were kind of like whatever. But then yeah. she, you guys get back. There's a whole there's yeah. a whole freaking you know romance story yeah. there going on and that's all covered um you're but now you get you graduate buds now yeah. you're in SQT yeah. seal qualification training and you're up doing land navigation in Alaska yeah and you start to like you have a little epiphany a little yeah. life one of your life epiphanies here yeah. you say as i walked through the wilderness it was hard to not to stop and admire the beauty the snow hadn't started to fall yet so everything was bright green trees were Trees were massive some shot up 200 feet in the sky being from the Bronx I'd never seen a place like this and never in a million years did I ever think I would end up in a place like this Remy I said to myself as I stood in awe at uh, My first stake. That's what you're looking for a land nav stake. You've come a long way Wow, this is so beautiful. I wish Cecilia could see this as I continued to walk I noticed that one of the most serene aspects of the Kodiak forest was the silence. There were times when I would hear an occasional chirping from a bird or rustling in the trees when the wind blew, but for the most part it was quiet. I was truly alone. Something miraculous began to happen while I continued through the wilderness. In the silence and the beauty, I began to reflect on my life, who I was and how I treated people. It was as though someone or something was holding up a mirror and showing me what I had become. And the more I walked and reflected, the more I didn't like what I saw. I saw a kid who stole an engagement ring from his mom and never confessed to her. Her. I saw a person who treated his own brother like he was worthless. I saw a person who had integrity when it was convenient for him, but didn't when it wasn't. I saw a prideful person whose favorite song had become, You Can't Tell Me Nothing. I saw a man who treated women like meat, and what hurt me the most was I saw a man who treated a woman who truly loved him with constant contempt. As the memories replayed in my mind, I began to be depressed, and then my depression led to anger. My anger led to questions. You did that. How could you do that to a person? What were you thinking? What's wrong with you? 
It was as though I had been outside my body on vacation for 26 years, and when I came back and home and saw the mess I had made, I was in shock. At that time of year in Kodiak, daylight was from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m., so when I got to the last stake at 8 p.m., it was still bright. In the brightness of the night, I made a vow. That's it. I'm going to fix me. I'm not going to be the same person I was anymore. I'm going to meditate more. I'm going to spend more time with my spiritual group. I'm going to buy a ring and propose to Cecilia, and I'm going to be the man that to her that I need to be. No more of this garbage. No more. No more. So, interestingly, while you're having yeah. that epiphany, yeah. she's having a, an epiphany as well. Yeah. And um, the epiphany that she's having is that she shouldn't be with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and of course, you can't really communicate. Yeah. Um, and it it just doesn't work out. Yeah. Um, then you get to you get to a point where you 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 have a uh, the ult- what you call a uh, chapter called the ultimate transformation. Yeah. And this is a, like a spiritual yeah. awakening yeah. for you uh, in church. Yeah. And you know you 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 basically uh, are you encounter God for the first time. Yeah. And um, you go through that in the book, and and it leaves you with this in a new in a new light, right? Yeah. You say day after day, I would experience experience miraculous events. I began to feel God's presence. I began to encounter Him in a tangible way, and I had so many dramatic encounters with God that all I wanted to do day in and day out was be with Him and do for Him and forsake the life I used to live so I could live this new life with Him. Dramatic. Yeah, man. Yeah, I went from sleeping around and not having sex at all. Yeah, you you went, you went, you became abstinent. Yeah, yeah, which is that's a miracle in and so <laughs> especially the way I was whoring. It was like you know, I had an encounter that no one could fix me, but God. And I had a lot of traumas from what happened in the Bronx, my childhood and traumas that I created for myself, scars, and I I searched for other things to bring me the healing that I needed, meditation, that helped to a certain extent, Um, women, relationships, affirmation from other people, but it was was just like putting a a Band-Aid on a gushing wound, you know? And then it was finally when, my brother would tell me all the time, because my brother became a Christian, like, when he was in college, and I used to make fun of him before, because I would fluctuate between atheism and agnosticism depending on the day of week, day of the week. And I and my brother would always tell me, Remy, when you hit rock bottom, not if, but when you hit rock bottom, just remember to cry out to Jesus. And I just remember mocking him for that. But when I was in that very, very dark point in my life uh, in Alaska and then even coming back, and nothing worked. And I just, I just kept on hearing these voices. I just, I was just in such a very dark, dark place. Yeah, I said, "All right, Jesus, help me. <laughs> if you're real, help me. Turn this around. Help me." And I'm not saying turn my situation around, but turn around what's going on in here, because what's going on in here is really tormenting me. And that's when it, that's when I felt for the first time peace. I felt like God was saying to me, "The Father that you had always been." searching for has been right here with you um and i am here with you and everything changed from there you know me and my wife were talking a couple nights ago before i left for new york and she was sharing a story that um, one of our neighbors was sharing it's a park by where we live and the neighbor was telling her that her her uh her daughter was getting picked up picked on by another kid in the park and the parent of the other kid wasn't saying anything. The parent was just allowing this kid to just, not just pick on her kid, but pick on other kids as well. And finally, the mother said something to the kid who was picking on her kid. And the actual mother, who had not been doing anything, ran over and screamed at the woman and said, how dare you ever correct my, my, my child? And as soon as my wife shared that story, I was reminded of a, the same exact situation that happened in the same park years ago with my oldest son he's he's nine now but he was five at the time and um this kid was just picking on a bunch of kids he was just like 
he was he was a bigger kid, but he was like pushing kids and making fun of kids and just doing things. And he saw my son, and uh, he like tapped one of his friends like, oh, "He's next. This kid's next." And he beelines towards my son. And I was sitting on the bench watching, and I just stood up, and all I said was, "Hey, that's my son." And in an instant, that kid stopped, looked at me, and went in the other direction. And just the power of having a father say, hey, that's my son, meaning I'm his protection. I'm his source. I'm I'm the person that he can cry on if something happens. That was what I felt when I had that transformation, when I when I when I cried out to God and said, help me. And it was as though he said, you're my son and I've always been here and I'm going to always be here now. And cover you and that is something that can't really be explained in words it was real heavy and even to this day like it's heavy even now when I go through stuff and uh struggling mentally um I, I, I always like I have that source to go to and that gives me peace and it gives me hope you know um especially with all of the stuff that I still deal with um in my head you know and uh um with my family and the battles in the business that I work in, in the film and TV industry, and even stuff, you know, working on the human, volunteering on the human trafficking side of things, and just the horror stories that I hear, um, and feeling hopeless. And then also, even the, the division in our country, you know what I mean? It's, it's like sickening to me at times because, you know, I came here with nothing, absolutely nothing. and put in the work and was able to rise to where I'm at today. And that's only possible because of the freedoms that America has allowed allotted to me. Um, and so to see how divisive we are as a nation, and I know, and I understand that part of it is there's outside forces that understand the, the concept of divide and conquer. And the plan is to conquer our nation. And they, and the way to do it is from within. Um, but to see how so many people are just falling into that trap just just crushes me at times and it messes with me. So, but I say all this to say, I always can go back to the source and say, God, I know you got me. You've brought me through worse. I know you'll bring me through this. And I know that you'll bring my kids through whatever's gonna come their way. So that's why um, that, whole, that whole story even now to this day touches me. And it's a good reminder for me. Um, a refresher for me as well. Yeah, it really, I mean, the name of the book is Transformed, yeah. and, and that is the transformation ultimately that has the biggest impact on yeah. you yeah. And, and the way you're gonna live your life. Yeah. Um, you end up uh, getting through SEAL qualification training. For those of you that don't know, Echo Charles, mm -hmm. human, human yeah. intelligence. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's obviously different ways to gather intelligence. You can study maps to gather intelligence. You can study data to gather intelligence. You can intercept the radio communications to gather intelligence. You can get intelligence from humans, from yeah. sources in the world. It's called human human intelligence. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole there's a whole craft to it, right? Yeah, yeah. Not only how to meet the right people, how to communicate with the right people, how to yeah. communicate the information, how to vet the information. There's a whole yeah. uh uh yeah, a whole a whole methodology to it and, yeah. and a lot of things that you need to learn to get into that world. It's becomes your kind of can become your specialty. Yeah. You know, eventually ended up going to I don't know if I can say the actual name of the school and I'm in this class. It's like all the stuff that I learned in the streets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's <just laughs> like I was like now it's just they're putting the terms behind it. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, because as I mentioned earlier, like I had to learn how to read people, especially when I'm hustling and doing certain things. And it really set me up nicely for when I got into the course and then went back on an appointment was actually deep into the human stuff and running sources and having to keep track and having to be a different per learn the personality of a source and then be a specific person to that source to collect the information so that we can then run it up the chain of command get it vetted against other intelligence and then hopefully go out the door and do stuff so um it, it, it was it was a cool world to be a part of that's for sure what do you remember about checking into team three it was it was empty right because it was nobody was really on the there. yeah yeah it was empty nobody was really there but it was it was it was uh 
seeing the pictures of the battles on the walls and stuff. It's seen like your guys and mm-hmm. you know, you, you know, Task Force Bruiser and just all of those pictures and it was just like wow. You know, it was like, holy crap, this is really happening, man. And then even like even the, you know, I didn't have, I can't recall if I had my uh, fob, not fob, but key card. Key card to get in. So somebody had to do it. But even that was like. You thought you were James Bond. It was it was like cool to me, yeah. man. You know what I mean? And then, you know, going down to seeing the armory. And I'm, again, I'm a kid from the Bronx that wasn't supposed to be here. You know, and so all of that stuff was eye opening, and even just being on the just being on the that side of the compound because mm-hmm. we were always, I mean, we had to run through the parking lot to get to the old course, mm-hmm. but for the most part, we were always separated from from that. So to be able to be actually be there and see and and uh, see the Mark Lee um, Trade at Center and all of that was like, it was it was it was surreal. Sure. Go in the other direction when I retired. Yeah. So I had my key card, yeah. and so I, I had my key card, and I was the admiral's aide for a while. Mm. And so when I had the when I was working for the admiral, I had access to like every building in NSW. Yeah. And so and when I left being the admiral's aide, I just kept that card, and they yeah. never changed anything. So I like just could go anywhere in NSW, yeah. just get into anything. Yeah. And yeah, and then that the last day, I remember I cleaned out my my cage. And I turned in that card, and I was like, "Yo, it's over. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's freaking over." Yeah, it's like the cop movies turning in your badge. Yeah. <laughs> um, you got some good word in here yeah. from uh, your chief. Yeah, yeah. And again, you know, things when you write a book, they start editing stuff and yeah, adding stuff and truncated. switching stuff around. Yeah. But this is, the, I think, this is worth. It's it's uh, Hudika. Yeah, Hootie. Hootie. And he says, uh, so he's kind of giving you a tour. You said, I could hear Chief's word echo up the long stairwell. This is as he's giving you a a tour. He says, if you're not early, you're late. Be at every platoon muster five minutes early. He was talking to me as if I was already part of his platoon. Always check, check, and recheck your gear. If we're out on an op or training and you run out of anything, I don't care what it is, batteries or whatever it is you needed, that's on you. Check that shit multiple times before you go out the door. Roger that, Chief. Hootie continued. Don't take anything personal. And if you fuck up, own it. This is the big boy club. No excuses. We exited the stairwell and made our way down to the platoon space hallway. When we got to the Delta platoon space door, I noticed the legendary Punisher skull emblem on the door. It was the emblem worn emblem worn by SEAL Team 3's Task Unit 2, Task Unit Bruiser, which was made up of two platoons, Charlie and Delta. Many legends were wore the skull patch, some of whom I was in buds with 250 and 251. Ryan Job, Michael Monsoor, and Mark Lee. One last thing, you're a new guy, so you know what that means? I replied quickly, I'm the first to volunteer for everything. You got it, Chief replied. Hootie opened the door to the platoon space. Sitting right in the middle of the platoon space was Chris Kyle. That moment really made me appreciate how far I'd come. It made me appreciate the caliber of people I had earned the right to work alongside. Who's the new guy, Chris asked. (laughs) Hootie Hootie answered, SO2 Adelake, he's from the Bronx. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, man, that was. Uh, was your first platoon with Chris? Yeah, 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 oh, dang, yeah, right yeah. And here's a. I didn't know who he. I didn't know anything about him. Yeah, yeah. No, you why would I mean? you? He's another team. Yeah, guy. I didn't know anything about him until later when people were like sniper and <laughs> done all of this and done that, and I was like, oh crap, like, <laughs> dude. <laughs> it's, again, it's surreal because, like I said, for me, I wasn't supposed to. You know, it's a world that I, I never envisioned being in, mm-hmm. and that not many people who come from the inner city of the Bronx <laughs> end up in, you know, yeah. or Compton or other places. So um, that was that was that was eye opening. Well, maybe if they'd let you go back and talk to the, your old school in exactly. the Bronx, you could get some people on the track and I know. on the path. Dude, and that's the craziest thing. I get opportunities to speak at like suburban schools all the time. No red tape, no nothing. Inner city schools all the red tape in the world. Um, even when I, when we've done stuff at an inner city school here in San Diego, all the red tape we had to cut through just to get inside. It's, it's, I think it's saddening. I think it's a part of it is, you know, they want to keep, again, this is my theory. I could be a hundred percent wrong, but like in these inner cities, they want to keep the cycle going Mm -hmm. because then that'll keep, people as victims and keep them making wrong decisions and keep those people in power who are, you know, in power. 
And and so that's my only explanation for why you wouldn't allow a person who was quote unquote a criminal but was able to arise out of the situation that, that he was in come back and tell these look these kids in the eye who I can identify with and they can identify. I've gone to prisons and spoken in prisons. Mm. And you'd be surprised at the guys that come up to me and be like, I wish you came and spoke to me when I was <sighs> when I was this age. Mm-hmm. Crying, guys in tears crying. You know what I mean? I get guys who read my book in prison and and you know, and I hear I you know, they don't write me, but I hear from, you know, the counselors, man, he was moved. I never saw I've never seen such and such inmate cry or show emotion. He's hard dude, he's in for murder, in for life, never getting out. And he read your book, came to me in tears. You know, we were talking earlier about like little decisions. Mm-hmm. And you made some good, you know, you made you made some jacked up decisions, yeah. but you made a couple key decisions yeah. that totally changed your life. Yeah. And you're already talking about, you know, the guy you used to run with is in prison right now, yeah. right? Yeah, right. So yeah. it's just as easy that you could have gone that direction. Yeah. And you make one little adjustment, one little change, one little maneuver that's that's the right in the right direction, yeah. your whole life is is changed. Yeah. And look, Michael Bay made a movie about the freaking seals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And made a bad boys. Yeah. He made like coincidentally a movie with some guys you could relate to yeah. and some guys that you thought that would be cool to be. Yeah. And that changed the trajectory of your life. Yeah. So for them not to let someone like you yeah. into a school yeah. and be like, yo, this is the deal. This is you guys can keep making these bad decisions or you can get out of this yeah. where you're at. There's a you know, people think there's no way out. There's ways out. Yeah, it is. Yeah. There's ways out. Yeah. You're living proof of that. Yeah. You know? Living proof of that. Yeah. That you can get out of those situations. Um, but if you don't get any guidance, I mean, if you didn't yeah. see that Michael Bay movie, yeah. if you didn't see uh, Bad Boys, yeah. you just wouldn't have, you know, you, you, you said it. That's what put on the radar yep. that you don't have to be a drug dealer. Yep. You don't have to be a criminal. You could take a, a, a better path. Yeah. And it was just that movie that showed you that. Yeah, it was that exposure. And that's, you know, my, like my, my brother's another good example. He ended up not going down the path I did because he was exposed to engineering. You know, my dad was an engineer. And so they, I forgot what age he was at, but he, how old he was, but he came across my dad's blueprints mm-hmm. and all my dad's engineering stuff. And that one instant of exposure was in his mind, he's like, I'm going to be an engineer. And ended up graduating high school for three years. In three years, Kennedy High School, which is, was a hard worse than Clinton at the time from a, from a safety standpoint. Mm-hmm. Graduated from there in three years. Got a full ride academic scholarship to Syracuse University. Graduated Damn. from there in three years. Got his master's in computer science engineering from Syracuse University in one year. Damn. And then like now maybe we should have him on a podcast, <laughs> yeah. bro. What's no, where yeah. you at? Yeah, he works for the DOE now. I mean, he worked for Saudi Ramco for a number of years. Yeah, he's, he'd be a great one to have on because that dude, he's a genius, and he knows a lot about what's going on with the water drying up in the in the country in Colorado and the West Coast. Blah, blah, blah. But I say all that to say, you know. He was exposed. It was that one moment of exposure that changed the trajectory of his life, mm-hmm. and that's what a lot of these kids need. They, you know, especially so, especially these kids without fathers, they're so they easily influenced. And mm-hmm. if you can have somebody come in and influence them in a positive way, somebody who they can identify with, and it doesn't have to be a long drawn out speech. It could just be one moment of somebody saying, "Dude, look at where you are. Look at where I'm at. You can be there." That's enough mm-hmm. for a lot of these kids. Yeah, they start saying. Ugh, is this where I want to be? Yeah. Is this where is this decision going to lead me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, going back to your story here, so you're now at the team. Yeah. You get into a platoon. Yeah. You did you go to human school right out of the gate? Yeah. Like as a new guy? Yeah. No. I, well, I went. I went to. I went after. Not during pro dev after ULT. I went. Okay, so got I went, it. I got it. After so you do your, you do ULT. Yeah, with you, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I never forget, man. Land warfare, bro. You killed half the platoon. And <laughs> keep going. I'll never forget. You came in and you were giving it to the task. You know, I was like, that's that dude's a beast. <laughs> Talk to everybody the same. No rank, brother. It was awesome, man. <laughs> I always joke like everybody in the teams from a brand new guy to the admiral all called me Jocko. Yeah, and yeah. I was yeah. like, yeah, that's the way. It is. Yeah. yeah, so you did you have any challenges? Uh was anything hard for you? Because no. you, you'd already been through with the Marine Corps. Like yeah. this stuff was pretty yeah. second nature for you at this point. Yeah, man. It was I, I land war. I mean, Marines do I mean they do those type of tactics yep. all the time. So I got out there and didn't have any problem. What was your job in the were you a gunner, a uh, machine gunner? No, I was a corpsman. 
Oh, no kidding. Yeah, so I was a corpsman. So I did the corpsman thing. Actually, before we went to ULT, um, I went to a soft OEMS. Cool. And did that course, and then I was the corpsman. And then uh, and then I went to Humid after, I don't know if we could say the name of the school, but we'll just say Humid for mm-hmm. the sake of yep. confidentiality, but I went there after ULT. So I went through CQC, love CQC. No factor. Awesome. No, yeah, no issue at all. Aaron Vaughn, yeah. I'll never forget, we were uh, <laughs> doing uh, – we were doing our FTX, uh-huh. and uh, there was somebody on the other side of the room. Was that we cleared all the rooms, and then the last room there was somebody like on the other end. Like it was like with these paint. I don't know what it was. It was these guns that had like paintballs. Yeah, in they, they were painful, dude. Legit paintballs. <laughs> yeah, probably just out of the freezer, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes old, sometimes my old tra- trade at homies, they'd be freezing, oh, some, freezing some paintballs. Yeah, get those things. Maybe they'd freeze them, but they definitely keep them in the fridge. Yeah, just the fridge is the next level. Yeah, right. Yeah. Oh, that was painful. And I remember we got to the last part, and and it was, it was the, we opened up the door, and this. It was like a machine. I don't know what type of gun it had, but it was like, blah, like a bunch of bullets coming down. And uh, we all kind of got back behind the corner. I was a point man. And, it, and there was another guy on the other side of the door, on the other side of the hallway. And uh, Aaron Vaughn was yelling, somebody get in there. What are you doing? I said, what are you going to do? You're not going to do anything. What are you going to do? And finally, I took one of the uh, the blue uh, grenade Grenades, things. Yeah. And I tossed it in there. And waited like a second and blew up that ran in and guy train came behind me, blah, blah, blah. And then everyone was like, that's what the fuck I'm talking about. That's what he's supposed yeah. to go in there and get after it. Hell and yeah. so I enjoyed it, man. And and uh, I'll never forget that. Again, it's these moments that always come to my mind, especially with guys who pass away like Aaron Vaughn or what happened on Extortion 17. Yep. But, you know, Mark Lee, Mikey Monsoor, it's just those moments of encouragement that always – kind of gave me that push to keep going and gave me the confidence to keep doing the job and so um so yeah i uh yeah i didn't have a problem there did diving did skydiving did it all and easy day and then um um yeah went to went to human school and uh, got open, you know got in and got through that it was kicked in nuts for the writing side of mm-hmm. it because it was a lot of writing um and then pumped out and there's deployment time i'm gonna go to the book here yeah back after fallujah yeah where you, you guys are fallujah yeah but yeah we went back to fallujah yep. after two minutes of holding on the door the team lined up behind me and i felt a squeeze on my shoulder i slowly moved up two steps or i slowly moved up the steps when i got to the entrance of the roof i saw the door cracked open i took my left hand off my m4 and pushed the door just enough for my team and me to make entry when the door didn't squeak i moved on to the roof I immediately saw two bodies 40 feet from my position. The roof entrance was at the center of the north end of the roof. The men were sleeping at the south end of the roof. They were lying about 10 feet, about 10 feet apart from one another. There was an AK-47 to the right of the guy on the right, which led me to believe he may have been Yassine's bodyguard. I kept the scope of my M4 pointed at the bodyguard's head while the team entered around me. With their guns trained on the body to the left, Three seals led by Sealod. Is that my saying? Sealod. Sealod. Sealod moved diagonally south toward the east wall. We set up a ha- half cross ambush with sleepers at the center point of the cross. Upon initiation, Sealod element Sealod's element would move west to the center point, while Eli and I moved to the south of the same point. Eli lined up behind me, and Hootie stayed at the door to monitor the takedown. After Eli gave me the squeeze, everybody moved swiftly as one. We met at the center point at the exact same time. Without stopping, I kicked the AK away from the bodyguard, then bent down and grabbed his ankle. Sealod's element was already on top of the second sleeper. I dragged the bodyguard like a rag doll to the south wall away from him while Eli followed me with his gun pointed at the man's head. After arriving at the south wall, Eli and I flipped the bodyguard over to examine his face. The look he gave us was priceless. He was frozen. He was in a frozen state with his eyes and mouth wide open. He couldn't move. I probably wouldn't either if I saw a six foot two, two hundred ten pound black eye with a ski mask and a silencer <laughs> on his gun just drag me out of my dream and into a nightmare. I live for that look. Why? Because in my opinion, a hundred percent of the terrorists are cowards. They kill innocent people. The high level terrorists send kids to blow themselves up, but never volunteer to do it themselves. Then they go and make a video and talk all kinds of trash about what they're about to do. So I loved being the one who wakened them from their dreams and said, what do you got to say now, homie? <laughs> the utter fear in their eyes nourished me. Um, so you're, yeah. you know, you go into 
a bunch. I, I obviously I skip around in the book, yeah. or just pulling out one of the ops that you're on. Um, you talk about the missions that you were doing. Yeah. You were obviously you were working the intel side, yeah. and then you guys would figure out where a target was going to be through yeah. various sources and various means, and then you'd go hit those targets. Yeah. And yeah. that's this is an example of what you are uh, yeah. what you're doing. Yeah. How was your op tempo on that deployment? Because it was good, man. We're doing a lot of DA, so it was like I would say maybe three times a week we would go out, mm -hmm. you know? Yep. Um, and then uh, there were times when we would get like the random, hey, we need you to come in mm -hmm. and, and help out with this or come up to, go, come up to Ramadi or mm -hmm. go up to Baghdad. And I was always busy. I mean, I was always like either in a source meet or, you know, talking to the source to get with another source and then going up to Ramadi to have a meeting with I can't, I'm trying yeah. to be careful with yeah. specific terms, yeah. but to have dialogue with the guy that is my boss on that mm -hmm. side of the things or the guys who are our boss and then even going up to Baghdad and I'll never forget Cinco de Mayo one year <laughs> on that particular deployment. They made me take, my publisher suggested I take it out the book, but I didn't see it was harmless, but where we were at, at, at the agency compound in Baghdad and sipping Cinco de Mayo's, on, uh, si sipping Coronas on Cinco de Mayo, <laughs> you know what I mean, by uh, Saddam's, uh, old, or in Saddam's palace yeah. that had been turned into a compound and uh, by the pool and I was like, man, I'll never forget this for the rest of my life, you know? I mean, I'm here talking to the feds before I was scared to death of getting wrapped up by the feds. And so um, it was all, I, I was always busy between um, the source stuff and going out and, you know, even meeting with shakes off of the compound mm -hmm. stuff like that. And then hitting the DAs. I mean, we worked from, we did that whole pump was like a vampire hours. Mm -hmm. So we were up at like 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. out the door, maybe like around 12 midnight, one o'clock mm -hmm. in the morning. Tried to get back before the sun came out. Mm -hmm. So, so it's a freaking great deployment. Yeah, I mean, just yeah. you're busy, you're getting after it. Yeah, um, uh, and that deployment during that deployment, and you talk about this in the book. Yeah. There's one dude that you're kind of really tracking hard. Uh, yeah, yeah, his name is Umar Zahid. Yeah, yeah. I changed the name up. <laughs> yeah, his, the yeah. name you use in the book is yeah. Umar Zahid, but this is a guy's. You know, yeah. he's a guy that's a, uh, uh, just a terrible. Yeah. Terrible subhuman yeah. killer of uh, women and children, yeah. and so you go into the book and you talk about the the efforts that you go through to try and track him down, try yeah. and figure out where he is. You, you go after him a few times, you don't get him. Yeah. Um, finally, you get to a point where, uh, and I'm going to fast forward a bit. Again, yeah. read, get the book and read the book, everybody. <laughs> you know, I'm not doing the audio book. Actually, yeah. you read the audio book. Yeah, too. I did the audio book. So yeah. get you want to hear you can and I hear did the audio for Chameleon too. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. You want to hear uh, Remy's version of Remy's story? Yeah. You don't have to listen to me do it. Yeah. Get the audio book. Yeah. Uh, at this point, fast forward. The, your, one of your sources tells you that that Umar's back in town. Yeah, this guy you've been looking for, mm -hmm. and then you get a location. Yeah. And it's time to track him. And you say, around 1 a.m., Mr. E called us in for a brief. All right, at 10 p.m., the drone followed Umar's last known vehicle to a farming area on the outskirts of town. One individual exited. We believe it's Umar. The drone has a large group of people sleeping at the front of the house, south side, and two individuals sleeping at the back of the house, north side. We're not taking any chances. We'll offload the assault team three miles to the east. The assault team consisted of the AOIC, Eli, Selad, Christian, Ox, me, and a few other operators. Looking at us, Mr. E said, you'll hike in, quietly take down the two individuals at the south end, then assess whether you have to conduct a second search among the north group. Roger, we all said. Any questions, Mr. E asked. We shook our head. Then Mr. E finished with mount up. As planned, we loaded the vehicles and with the lights off, slowly drove to the insert point. When we got there, the assault force offloaded, then started the hike. We crept through the large flat farmland. There was a full moon, so we made sure to spread out. And anytime we thought we heard or saw something that would give us away, we melted to the ground in a prone position. At about 3 a.m., we finally arrived at the house. There was a large row of bushes running north to south that lined the east side of the property. Eli slowly peered through the bush, and I was able to see two individuals who were fast asleep. Two men, no weapons visible, no suicide visible, he whispered over the bone mics. AOIC commanded in a low tone, Roger, Sammy, or sorry, Remy, Selod, 
move through the bush onto the property and line up on the east wall facing the two sleepers. We nodded, then fall sm- found a small opening in the bush to creep through without making noise. Our fire team was essentially setting up an ambush similar to the one we'd used when we captured Umar's brother. Upon indication, c and I were going to move north from the corner of the east wall and capture the sleeper on the right side while the rest of the team was going quietly take down the sleeper on the left. Once I got in position and gave the AOIC the nod, he whispered over the bone mic, initiate. As I quietly crept north to the body on the right, fire team two moved in toward the second body. It was like a synchronized dance. I moved in with my IR laser trained on the head of the sleeper. I dare you to move, I thought. Four Four steps, five steps, six. He was only about 30 feet from me, but the walk seemed to take forever. Sweat was dripping down my helmet, and my heart was racing in anticipation. I had set a goal to capture Umar Zahid at the beginning of deployment, and in, and in moments, I might achieve it. When I got to the man, he was still fast asleep. It was Umar. His face had been posted at my trailer desk for seven months, and now I had him in the flesh. Honestly, I wanted to put a bullet straight through his head. Not for me, but for the hundreds of innocent innocent people he'd killed and the family members who were left behind. I continued my scan to ensure he wasn't wearing a suicide vest or had a gun. All of this took place in seconds. Once I finished my scan, I kicked Umar over, which startled him from his sleep. Then I knelt down on his back with my left hand and pressed down on the back of his neck. Don't move, I whispered. And I'll close it out. Close out the book with this. I turned and looked at the AOIC, who was in the process of zip tying the second individual, and whispered, Jackpot. And then I thought, now I can go home. <laughs> it's a good way to end a deployment, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, man. And, and it's not the end of the book, yeah, but yeah. I, I mean, for, uh, for get the book. <laughs> yeah. Go read the rest of the book. Yeah. A bunch of other stuff um, going on here. So yeah. from there, you do what? Another deployment? Yep, do another deployment, do an augment, do another deployment, do, um, I don't even know, I, be careful the way I say it, but it's national, they maybe take out certain terms in the, when the DOD. We'll just say it. more deployments. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you do more deployments. Yeah. Um, meanwhile, you meet your wife, Jessica. Yeah. You start having kids. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And so you do two more deployments, you said? Yeah. And you, you continue working as a medic, as human, a corner? Yeah, medic mainly. But you yeah, start going he, he, more in the human. More in the human stuff, yeah, especially when we did the national level tasker. Mm-hmm. Um, be careful about what I talk. I, tr- I cut a lot of it. Yeah. The book for the sake of well, stuff. But, uh, you don't need to say anything. Yeah, it's good enough. We, yeah, uh, we understand. Yeah. It's all good. Yeah. You're working high level missions yep. on these deployments. Yep. Um, and then, like, at a certain point, you think about getting out yeah so yeah. What, what what triggers that uh my kids man my oldest son was uh born in 2014 my second son was born in 2015 mm-hmm. and having had my dad die when i was five i wasn't fearful of death it was more so I, you know how it is mm-hmm. with work up deployment being gone i mean gone is almost as a lot i mean it's almost as much during work up as you are during the deployment sometimes depending on the deployment cycle uh excuse me the work up cycle and uh, i just wanted to be home with my kids man mm-hmm. i wanted to be dad yep so that was the main decision and, and your wife's a doctor yeah she's a doctor yeah. was she when did she graduate from medical school uh she graduated from medical school in i want to say june no sorry may of 2011 i want to say oh okay so yeah. she was a doctor yeah. While you were in the teams. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, she, uh, I met her when she started residency. Oh, she okay. started, she moved down here yeah, to start residency. Right she went to residency at, um, on the other side of uh, Chula Vista, mm-hmm. age for Kaiser. Okay. Ka- Kaiser, I believe. Yeah. So you kind of at least had some kind of uh, financial stability with your no, wife. No. <laughs> Dude, she's a doctor. Residency. Oh, residency. They don't make no, no money. No, wait, residency. but 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 by this time, yeah. By the time you were looking at getting out, she was done with the residency, or no? No, because she oh. had she had her, her residency got extended because she had my 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 son. Oh, okay. During residency, so she had to take a break in residency. They allowed her to graduate with her starting class, mm-hmm. but then she had to go back and finish her ULT. <laughs> and, and, that, and that's like a couple years, three years. Three years, yeah, man. And that's like you're making like thirty eight thousand dollars a year. Not, I don't know the exact number, but she it, wasn't making much, much it, of anything. It ain't much. Yeah, she wasn't making much of anything. So with that, you decide, even with her only yeah. making eight, whatever, yeah. not enough to support the fam. Yeah, yeah. You're like, I'm gonna get out. I was always smart with my money. 
Oh, okay, um, so you had. Well, I was smart savings. with my money after I had, you know, my faith transition. Before that, I was like crazy with the money. But yeah, I was. I was. God pretty, was. God yeah. was good with your yeah, money. Yeah, yeah. yeah God was Remy good. Was. Better than I was, man. <laughs> so I saved a lot of money, and then from the deployments, yeah. you know, I instead of buying a flashy car when I came back, put it in an account, mm-hmm. let it, you know, save it. That's how I was able to buy my first house when I got back from that uh, second deployment um, uh, in 2010. Mm-hmm. I was able to buy first house by myself before I even met my wife, and so. By the time I got out, we had a good cushion, and then I was—I already started. Um, I finished my bachelor's while I was in. I was able to—I was taking classes, online classes, and then I started my master's. And so when I got out, I was still in grad. I, I was able to use a post 9/11 GI Bill. Got it. So that was providing some cover for us as well. And I was planning on going into business consulting full time because my my wife's brother's a YPO guy. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure you work with those yeah. guys a bunch of times. And so he was getting me like side consulting gigs mm-hmm. with his YPO chapter in Toronto and stuff like that. So I wanted to get my, my, my master's because I didn't want to just rely on the team guy side of things. I wanted mm-hmm. to have it, but I also wanted to have the, that theory and the academics as mm-hmm. well. And so uh, I was in school and my plan was to just, you know, finish out school and then work with my brother-in-law full time. What year did you leave the Navy? January, 2016. January, 2016. Yeah. So when did your first, what was the first acting opportunity that yeah. you had? Was this the, was this yeah. last ship? Is this, is this a movie? What is last ship? I yeah. saw it on the yeah, internet, yeah, but yeah. I don't know what it is. It was, it, it, it was like uh it was on TNT. Like a TV like, show? Yeah, it was like a TV show on TNT. So I did like some extra stuff. I don't even call that acting. Okay. I, I don't even want to call it acting. I just literally just how, showed up the base and shot on, I, sat on the boat. I, I, yeah. How'd that come from? Like, where'd that come from? Team Guy Network. So some team guy's yeah. like, yo, yo you want to yeah. sit down here? Yeah. I'll yeah. give you 400 bucks. Yeah. You're like, we'll do it. Yeah. Let's yeah. go. Yeah, yeah. So then what's never too late this is a play that yeah you that was a play yeah that was uh so you had to straight up this is it you can't you can't pass this one off I know, bro I know. you can't pass this one off i know yeah this lady at my church she was like uh hey um they're doing a play down in um uh down i forgot where it was downtown san diego that mall it was a, it was a theater it used to be by the mall horton plaza yeah, okay. yeah horton plaza there's like a theater like right under Right, pretty much right in the okay. mall area, and uh, it was like you just need you to be a pastor or something. Like, give a in speech. the play, in the play. Yeah. Okay, so I went and did that, but okay. I was like, I don't want to have anything to do with this anymore. Did you? How many? How many shows did you do? It was just. It was. One, it was just one show. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was just one show. Right. Yeah, it was like they, they, it was like a big bill, like a. It was like a big for training. I don't even know what they call it, but like a training. But I didn't show up most of the time because I was in school. I was just like <laughs> showed up. Uh, yeah, I just memorized my lines and then. All I had to do was give a speech at the end. But you didn't really like it that much. No, not at all. Not at all. So then came Transformers. Yeah. Right? Yeah, this yeah. is now 2015. So you're still in the 2016. Navy. 2016. Oh, it's 2016. Yeah, it's okay. 2016. Yeah, 2016. Yeah. It's May. And so are you out of the Navy now? Yeah. I got out in January. And then, then I was in grad school. And then uh, in May of 2016 is when I got the phone call. I was, I was actually in my office writing papers mm-hmm. uh, for school. And who, what was the connection there? Um, there was a woman who worked with a guy by the name of Kevin Kent. Yeah, I know Kevin. And uh, so she, I guess Kevin Kent had given her my phone number. Okay. And so she reached out to me and she was just like, hey, you know, Kevin Kent told me about you and Bay's looking for some frogmen to, to work tomorrow in L.A. Mm-hmm. What's your schedule looking like? And I was like, oh. I wasn't interested in doing it. But she was like, uh, you know, it's a good opportunity. So I was like. All right, we'll give you five hundred bucks. Yeah, we'll give you five hundred. I was like, all right, you and know. it's Michael Bay, right? Yeah, so there's Michael a little Bay. bit of yeah. uh, and that you had to be stoked yeah, on that. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. But she, but that didn't come out. I'm truncating it, but that didn't come out until like a little bit later in the conversation. Oh, okay. She didn't want to tell me what the movie was until you know, until she found out that I was like more interested, like invested, like my priorities oh, were in the right place. God, so Ooh, then that's later. a little trick. Yeah, yeah. She played a little I trick did. on yeah. you. You could be like, yo. I don't care. Because <laughs> her husband, her husband's a team guy. Oh, okay. Harry Humphreys is her husband. Oh, uh, okay. So she's been around a lot of team guys mm-hmm. and put a lot, her and her husband put a lot of team guys in, in, in films and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I guess it was part of her vetting process to make sure I wasn't going to be like a, I don't know, like a, a, a fanboy or something, mm-hmm. going not knowing how to act on set and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, uh, but yeah, I, you know, I said, she finally said, hey, send me some pictures. I sent her some pictures. She said, hey, uh, um, all right, babe, approved your pictures. And uh, 
come up to LA tomorrow. So and, then you get up there. Yeah. But it, you, this turns into bigger. Right? Yeah, yeah. That one day, uh, turning into three weeks. After that one day, she calls me back and said, "Hey, babe, like that your your performance and and your consulting, and then that you could take uh, take direction. Can you uh, do three weeks? We're mm-hmm. gonna do a week in Arizona." Was JP in this with you? JP. Or was he JP Danell? Yeah, 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 yeah. This is the yeah, same yeah, one. Yeah, okay. Yeah, this was the same one. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, that one week turned in one day turned into three weeks. I met JP. Yeah, he went out to London with us. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. He went out to London with us. That's right. That's right. Now I remember. So he wasn't in Arizona and Michigan. He came later in Michigan. Yeah, he was he, he wasn't in, in Arizona, but he came out later to Michigan to replace a bunch of other team guys. Mm-hmm. And then I stayed on and went to London with him in Wales. Mm-hmm. And then and then came back here in San Diego and we filmed some stuff in December, uh, down in uh on base mm-hmm. on uh Naval Air Station base. So three weeks is total time that you spent on this? No, six months. Six months? Yeah, yeah. So I so I was in. How much are you in the movie? I'm in a good chunk of it. I'm in it from beginning to end. It's like oh, no shots, kidding. I got lines and everything in that movie. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I got the line. You're right in it from beginning to end? The yeah, whole pretty movie? much. Yeah, not like not the first scene, but like from yeah. the first act of the film to the last act of the film. And what do you say? How many oh, lines? Man, do you I got have? a couple good lines. I got the "We going home, Izzy?" at the end <laughs> when <laughs> I yeah. strap her on her on me in tandem with her, and then I have some other uh, lines at Mark Wahlberg, "Put it down," and all that kind of you know, one liners and uh-huh. stuff like that. Not like heavy dialogue stuff, but uh, um, and then there's some there's a line I have in the plane with Mark Mark Wahlberg and and some of the other actors, mm-hmm. uh, but the big one that's like clear, like this one I. Skip the, oh, and then there's a line when a girl comes up to me and I have like a like a bazooka. Like it wasn't even, it was like a, 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 a transformer level bazooka type thing. And she's like, does that thing kill Decepticons? And I look at her, I say, no, we do. And then I grab the wall. That's the line I was looking for, you know? That's the line I was looking for. Okay, so that's, what's next after that? Is it who dares wins? Or am no, I that just, didn't come until that later. Come later. Yeah, that came like in two 2021 is when I did the my first season of Who Dares Wins. Um, we did that out in Jordan. Okay. Uh, did two seasons of that out there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what about Ambulance? So Ambulance is yeah. another movie. Yeah, is yeah. Is that another Michael Bay movie? Yeah, that was another one. I did Six Underground before that. So Six Underground, I, was, I, I didn't act in Six Underground. I was the consultant on Six Underground. Six in the ground? Six Underground. Six so Underground. That was on Netflix with Ryan Reynolds and... Uh, and uh, Corey Hawkins and a bunch of we shot that in in Italy like all over Italy and then Abu Dhabi mm-hmm. and uh, and I, tra- I trained with the actors before we went out there and shot I wasn't really on camera much I just mm-hmm. had like one scene but I was on the whole shoot for like four months just working on the consulting side mm-hmm. of things and then uh, did Ambulance which was Bay's next film and then what's your what's your role in Ambulance I played an undercover cop <laughs> uh-huh. so I played a undercover cop that was uh, setting helping set up the uh, bank robbers so we knew that i mean it wasn't really explained much in the script but uh-huh. essentially we got intel that the bank robbers were going to rob this particular bank so it's like i was like an undercover cop okay. but then i also did some consulting on that as well so consulting means you're telling them like hey you should not shoot this yeah, type of weapon yeah. or like don't or even go in the room the like script. this yeah even even looking at the script and like just saying okay this dialogue doesn't make sense here mm-hmm. or doesn't make sense for this to happen to this part of the screenplay because you know, tactically, that wouldn't happen that way. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so that was kind of how I got into the, would later get into the WGA and end up becoming a WGA writer in Hollywood is reading, get in, getting off of these scripts and saying, hey, can you read these scripts and consult on them? And then I would consult on the scripts. And I was like, dude, I, I think I could actually write these scripts mm-hmm. <laughs> better than some of these people write these scripts. And then I started writing scripts and got into the WGA that way. And so what was the first script that you wrote? I g- adapted a book called Slave Stealers into a limited series. Um, and so that it hasn't shot yet, but um, uh, it's the Tim Ballard. Tim Ballard has a book called Slave Stealers where he jumps back and forth between his story and a woman by the name of Harriet Jacobs. So Harriet Jacobs was a slave in the 1800s, and she was doing all kinds of – She, I mean, her story is crazy. She was doing trade craft before anybody even knew what trade craft was, mm-hmm. and she was a slave, and she, like, intentionally got impregnated – and that, in or, 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 order to be able to use that to escape slavery, it was her story is crazy. She was wearing disguises, and 
after she escaped, she came back to the town and eating to North Carolina. I mean, her story is just ridiculously crazy. And she's the first known slave to have written an autobiography. And sure. so uh, called, uh, what was it called? Uh, incidents of a incidents of a slave girl or something like mm-hmm. that. And so Tim kind of did a, did a book where he jumped back and forth and, and, and took techniques that she used to rescue other slaves and how he applied those te- applies those techniques in what he does or what he did at the time in OUR mm-hmm. Operation Underground Railroad. Mm-hmm. And so um, I adapted the flashback chapters essentially into a limited series. And that's being made for Netflix, you said? Uh, a streamer hasn't oh, signed on yet, but it's being made for a streamer. Yes, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, what else? What? So you got, that's a bunch of stuff. Yeah. 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 That's a bunch of stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, the latest that thing that you got going on right now yeah. is Chameleon. Chameleon. This, yeah, is yeah. A, this is your first book. It's my first first fiction, fiction book. book yeah, I mean, first fiction book. First yeah, fiction yeah, book. Yeah. Tell us about Chameleon. What's yes. the deal with this thing? So Chameleon is, uh, I say, it's like somewhat of a fictional extension of Transform. You know, all the stuff that I couldn't talk about mm-hmm. and would never talk about in Transform is like wholly fictionalized, right? So mm-hmm. like the plot and the characters and the places and even Kali Kent is very loosely based off of me. The name is based off of a kid in the Bronx by the name of Khalif Browder. So Kali's full name is actually Khalif Browder Kent. There's a kid in, in the Bronx who grew, grew up not too far from me. <laughs> And uh, he was unjustly uh, uh, accused of stealing a backpack, sent to Rikers Island Jail at 16, held in, at Rikers Island for three years without trial. I mean, he was put in general population with adults, beat up. Sp- he spent 700 days in solitary confinement. And then he was so tormented after he got out that he committed suicide two years later. And he, the only reason why he got out is because the, the, a judge finally looked at the, his case and said, oh, um, there's no evidence here to charge him. And so uh, they dismissed the case and then, you know, let him let him free. So anyway, the, the character's main name is Khalif um, Browder Kent, um, loose, you know, very loosely based off of me. But the name comes from that. And he's part of a, a secret program called the Black Box, mm-hmm. the CIA program called Black Box, essentially um, made up of people with different specializations. You have chameleons who are able to become whatever character they need to become at the drop of a dime, but it's all grounded. They're mm-hmm. just very good method actors. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have ghost agents who are people who are able to get in and out of places like a ghost. Um, you have uh, aberration agents who are a combination of, of chameleons and ghosts, but they do it for a decade plus. Then you have win agents who are pretty much Swick. They could drive any vehicle like the wind. Um, and they're all part of a team called Dark Horse. And in this particular book, um, they are trying to find the identity and uh, of a um, South African uh, mastermind that's manipulating worldwide stock markets in order to cause economic collapse. So I didn't want to go with the traditional the bad guy has a nuclear bomb or the bad guy <laughs> has a biological chemical weapon that he's gonna set I wanted to go, you know, on the on a financial economic warfare side of things because I think that a lot of people now it's more plausible now with well, at least to pe- to to the general population it's more plausible with everything that happened financially after COVID and even where we are um with the recession now and well then pending recession and all of these things that are happening financially. I want to sh- want it to be able to portray a villain that is using his brain to essentially destabilize uh, the Western world and Western economies and cause even more chaos than in some cases, you know, a bomb can sometimes. It seems like he'd be able to possibly get away with that. Yeah. That's the that's kind of crime you can get away with like right in front of everybody. Yep. Yep. And they don't understand like, well, you know, well, it seems like the stock market's down and this guy happened to make whatever, yeah. you know, uh, sold shorts on these companies yep. that went on, you know, like that's start manipulating that kind yep. of thing. You kind of do it in front of people's faces. Yep. And part of what he's doing is he is, uh, you know, he'll buy stock in a specific company and then he will have his, uh, his team essentially take, take somebody in that company hostage and then uh, essentially force force the CEO of the company to make a specific business decision that's going to either allow the stock to go up or the stock to go down. So uh, he does this under the table clandestinely so the general public doesn't know what's going on. So it's a, it's, it's, it's very intricate espionage type, uh, uh, corporate espionage is a part of it as well. And uh, so different, different. Mm-hmm. And so Kali and his team are tasked to essentially, essentially bring this guy 
in and, and shut it down. But then there's also, uh, you know, the, the backdrop of it takes place during obviously what's going on now with Ukraine and Russia. So mm-hmm. there's a connection there as well um, um, with uh, with uh, with the antagonist and what he's doing. Mm-hmm. And then the substratum of the book is, uh, is is national unity. Like I, you know, when I'm when I'm um, writing a story, whether it's a screenplay or whether it's a book or whatever it is, like I always try to put some type of inspirational, educational, motivational message in there. Otherwise, I think that it's a waste of a, a, of a person's time, you know, to spend two hours on a book or, sorry, two hours in a film or 11 hours on a book and, and they invest that time and, and all they get out of it is are, are thrills and laughs. I think that, you know, I truly believe that as a storyteller, my job is to kind of engage them in a different way or challenge them in a different way. And so, the uh, again, the substratum of the book is the importance of national unity and what happens when we don't have national unity. And I also dive into the fact that the reason why we are so divided is because it's actually, it's not just coming from outside entities, but a big part of it is coming from the top. Um, politicians and, 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 and people in Washington, D.C. that kind of needs us to be divided in order to maintain uh, power over the groups that they want to maintain power over. So that's like, it's it's not just an espionage thriller and an action thriller, but it's also a, uh, it's also a political thriller as well. To try to engage people's mind and get them thinking, um, what am I doing that's, that's contributing to the disunity? Not just in our nation, but in my family or in my community or you know in my state and what can I do better so it's, it's essentially holding up a mirror kind of like what has happened to me and mm-hmm. we talked about where I've had to have a mirror a proverbial mirror held up to my face to show me what I've been doing wrong so I'm hoping that the book acts access that and, and brings the healing that or well, plays a role in bringing healing that's necessary to our nation what was your writing methodology how are you writing what do you do uh, you know, for me, I have uh, my writing starts long before I actually get to the computer and start structuring out and putting, you know, proper pen to paper. Mm-hmm. So, for example, Chameleon has been in my head for over 10 years and I have a notepad, not a physical notepad, but a digital notepad where when certain things came to me, like the idea about it, there, it, um, the finances being a, a, the backdrop and, and, the, and the antagonist, mm-hmm. uh, I, I I can't re- remember what I saw, but I was watching something on on uh, 60 Minutes one day, and uh, the inter- the um, interview was asking this guy questions about how somebody could, uh, I think it had to do with insider trading mm-hmm. and what's going on there, and how people are getting rich, and I was like, huh, it'd be interesting if there was a uh, it was a bad guy that was uh, using insider trading in a different way, and so I just dropped that into my notepad. This might have been like three or four years ago. Then one day I hear somebody say something, and I'm like, oh, that would be a great line of dialogue. So over the course of ten years, I'm just putting all of this information in, and uh, and then one day when I decided, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna create this world. Then now all I have to do is take what I put in that notepad, and I just now put it in a structure uh, from three-act structure. Here's where this is going to happen. Here's where this is going to happen. Here's when I'm going to intro, uh, introduce the villain and so on and so forth. And even now, like for Chameleon Book 2 and Chameleon Book 3, like I'm, I'm, ideas come to me, I drop them in. Even with screenplays, mm-hmm. ideas come to me. When I was writing the Transform screenplay, like I had the book as a reference, but there were so many stories that didn't make it into the book. Or as we talked about how to be mm-hmm. truncated and changed, I was like, oh, maybe I could take that part and put it in, in, into the... Uh, into the into my notepad and I would put it into notepads and then when I, when I got to writing the screenplay a lot of what I needed to essentially the meat was there now I just had to massage it and then my, my process is just sitting down and 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 I I, I tend to not outline mm-hmm. or if I do outline I uh, it's I'm not I'm not regimental on it mm-hmm. you know I, I, it's not the gospel to me so when I take all of these ideas and, and put it in into this space, even if it's structured, I don't hold to it. I like because I like characters to tell the story. For me, it's always about character driving plot and driving narrative versus plot driving characters and what they do. So once I get a good sense of of, of the character I'm writing, whether it be Kali Kent, whether it be Navea, whether it be Thane Macklin, whoever it is, how they would react is going to drive where we where, where we're going to go into the story. So for example, if if Kali is uh, if I've already established him as a guy that's going to uh, conduct an interrogation in a way where he's not going to go straight in and, and start screaming or yelling or he's going to be a bit more calculated, then that's how that scene is going to be driven. 
because that's his personality. And there's times where I don't know exactly what's going to happen in the scene that I'm going to write, whether it's a book or whether it's a script. I allow that character with the attributes that I've kind of given him or he or he or he or she has shown me begin to fill in the gap. Mm-hmm. And then before you know it, you have like a very cool scene, especially with dialogue and mm-hmm. stuff like that that comes together. So can you write for a long time at a time? Like I can only write for like an hour and I get super bored. So I just <laughs> like write an hour every day. Oh, no, I know. I, I could write for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, it's, it's I, I go for time because, of, you know, my, my nanny starts at eight thirty. Got to work out. I'm, I don't do I don't do the three a.m. work wake ups like you, Jock. I'm sorry, man. I ain't on it like you here yet. <laughs> uh, and so uh, so uh, you know I work out, and then after that I come to my I get to my computer, and I'm 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 at my computer from say about ten thirty until my nanny gets off at four thirty, and I write for time. So six hours. Yeah. Yeah. Dang. And then sometimes, um, like if if I'm on a time crunch and I need to get it done or I need to get into a publisher or I need to get a script into a product, a producer or whatever mm-hmm. the case may be after my nanny's off, hang out with the kids once they're in bed and in, in bed, like around nine o'clock, I'm back at the computer and I'm there until about two, three in the morning, just hammering it out t- just to get it done. So I go for time. I wish I had a little log book in it and I could make a version of my books where yeah. each section I wrote where I wrote it. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, like some random, <laughs> like bus, train, yeah, yeah. freaking airplane. A lot of, a lot, I wrote a lot in airplanes and hotels. Oh, uh, I travel a bunch, so I'd just yeah. be like on a plane, just get my hour done. Yeah. You know, sometimes obviously be, be my house, but yeah, there's a, you just, I, I would do, cause I write every day okay. when I'm, when I'm writing, I'm going every day for yeah, like an hour. Yeah. Okay. Because otherwise I get bored and crazy. And so I just like write an hour. So but, it must take you a long time to get it done. Uh, well, you know. A thousand words a day because I can write. I write about a thousand words in okay. an hour, yeah, so good. it's about you know three months. Okay, and you got ninety thousand words. Pare it down, you got yeah. your book. Oh, they, oh yeah. so I can knock them out pretty quick, actually. So no writer's block in that one hour. Is this like you? No, nope. just no. Nope. Um, I also I will have like you. I'll have the whole thing in my head. Yeah. So I have the whole thing in my head. Yeah. And I just got it, and I take the whole thing that's in my head, outline it, like I write it down, yeah. like. Basically, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, cha- whatever, and then I have like a very brief description mm-hmm. of what's going to happen in that chapter. Yeah. You know, in this chapter, Uncle Jake shows up and he takes him to jujitsu. Like I know what's going to happen, and I, I kind of already have that whole thing in my head. Yeah, uh, you know, in this one, you know, Regan, Mark's going to do this, yeah. or what Johnny's going to do this, whatever, and then I just sit down and I write for an hour, whether no matter where I'm at. Yeah. I always leave like what's gonna happen in the next frame or uh, whatever. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I when I sit down again, I just can yeah, you have a lead in. Yeah. And if you don't for me, if I don't write every day, then when I sit back down, if I skip a day, I can probably get away with it. Yeah. If I skip two days, now I gotta go back and read everything that I wrote. God, it takes yeah, me yeah. twenty minutes, now I wasted a bunch of time. So yeah. I'm very religious about writing it every day so yeah. I don't have to do that review. Yeah. But that's what I do. Yeah, if I wrote for six hours a day, that'd be 6,000 words a day. Man, I could write a book pretty freaking quick. Yeah, that's good, yeah. But I don't have the patience for it. Yeah. <laughs> I get too freaking jumpy after a little while. Oh, I'm like, yeah. oh, I can't. I get distracted. I love it, man. I don't mind. Uh, it's just, that's what, that's what drives me, man. Well, it's yeah, like, I think what you, you yeah. said is that there's scenes that you're, that are playing out in your head yeah. as you're writing. For yeah. me, I don't have that. Yeah. I already know what's going to happen. So for me, it's just like, it's like, I'm building a house. Like yeah. you're building, you're like an architect yeah. that's designing a house. Like, yeah. oh, what is this going to look like? Yeah. I already know what it's going to look like yeah, in my yeah, head. Yeah, yeah. I already know. So for me, it's just a, it's just labor. Yeah, yeah, yeah It's just yeah, labor yeah, and a yeah. freaking type. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. nothing exciting about yeah, it. I already know the story. <laughs> <laughs> there's no, there's no discovery. In yeah, the there's no really. discovery yeah, for yeah, me. Yeah, it's already yeah, in there, man. Yeah. The whole freaking thing. I actually like the lyric, the lyrics, or I guess yeah. in books you call when I write songs, you know, I call them lyrics. Mm. But in you know when I'm writing books, I guess it's just words or dialogue. Yeah, yeah I already yeah. know what that's going to be. I already have those things in my head. So, cool, anyways, right. that's that's me. Yeah. Um, so, wh- so you said you're already working on the next two chameleon books. So are you gonna yeah. do chameleon books and then ghost books and then aberration books and then wind books. But uh, well, I right now I'm, I'm I'm following the main character chameleon. So I'm gonna do two more books in chameleon for sure. And then but the the ghost agents are in. So part of the part of the team in mm-hmm. book one is made up of a ghost agent, another chameleon agent, a few aberration agents, and then uh, a win agent. 
Um, and so we're going to keep following Kali and the Chameleon uh, in book two and three, and then maybe we'll branch it off yeah. you know, into a, DC, a graphic we'll, novel. Maybe we we'll, don't know what's going down yeah, with yeah. The, the aberration <laughs> agents. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I like to it hear. It started out as a screenplay. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, uh, I I wrote the screen. It was the first screenplay I wrote in 2019. And then, um, uh, long story short, my agent shopped it around and there were three production companies that wanted. We went with one, one of the big ones, and uh, went through a year of rewrites on the screenplay. And then after, after, after that, he started. My agent, uh, that started the producer, started shopping uh, the screenplay around to directors to get a director mm-hmm. attached, and uh, got the same. Kept getting the same message: great screenplay, but I'm booked up for the next two years. Great screenplay, but I'm booked up for the next three years. And that was when I was like, you know what? I'm tired of this. I want to. I want to teach myself how to direct. Because it's kind of like almost in the teams. Like the more qualifications you have, the more ops you're going to go mm-hmm. on, and that's kind of how it is in the whole Hollywood. If you could write, if you could produce, write, and then direct, then you most Let's likely go. be able to get the job done. And so uh, I directed my organ harvesting film, and then that got picked up to be a feature film, which is going to go into production after the writer strike lifts because we can't get bonded insurance wise during a writer strike. But uh, chameleon script is going, chameleon film is going to come at some point as well. Mm-hmm. And what's the organ harvesting film? So I did a film called The Unexpected, uh, inspired by true events. Um, uh, essentially, come, it's based off of the, uh, the Yazidis genocide, uh-huh. uh, where ISIS came in and, and uh, essentially killed the men and then uh, um, uh, trafficked the women sexually, but also uh, from an organ harvesting stand- standpoint and then also in the, um, from a labor standpoint. And so um, I started, I, I, I volunteered with a few different human trafficking nonprofits after I got out, you know, nothing like where I'm working with them for months on end but just popping in here and there almost like a contractor and that's when I really got exposed to human trafficking and I found that there was so much focus on the on the sex trafficking side of things and not any focus on a organ harvesting side of things and so that's when I decided you know what I, I need to educate the public more about this and that's when I decided to make the the film The Unexpected um, which is a which is a 32 minute short film uh, that really dives deep into the int- intricacies of organ harvesting rings and how they operate uh, which organ harvesting is a billion dollar multi-billion dollar industry globally and uh, it's 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 nuts the more you go down a rabbit hole and learn about it Cairo Egypt is considered to be the organ harvesting capital of the world uh, there's been so many stories coming out as of you know, lately of, of, of Westerners getting caught up you know going to other countries to get a kidney um, and uh, uh, via organ harvesting ring because about 6,500 people die every year on uh, on transplant waiting lists and so there's a there's a big need for it. And so um, the more I started going down a rabbit hole and, and, and reading these articles and doing more research, that's when I was like, OK, I need to make this film. And uh, so, so where can people know, watch that? Uh, the film's on YouTube. Oh, it's, it's on, on YouTube. YouTube. Yep, it's free on YouTube. Who? What YouTube channel? Uh, my YouTube channel. Just What's Remy your YouTube channel? Uh, just Remy Adelaide. I, I looked that up. I didn't find it. Yeah. Unless I need to look harder. Yeah, just Remy Adelaide. Unexpected. It'll pop up there. It's right on the homepage. Okay. Of it. And, you know, I... I, I uh, I just made it just to get it out there, and you know, not to, uh, not to, for it to get distributed. But it got seen by some people in the industry. And now, that's what got got picked up to be a feature. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. It, will it be a documentary feature or uh, no? Just to our, to our actor film. film. Yeah, actor film. Yeah. Similar right on. to the short film. Picks up five years after the events of the short. Sweet. Um. What else? You got, I mean, you got anything else going on? <laughs> what else we need to hit, man? Uh, um, got a new. I got a. Well, I was working on Special Forces Fox, not doing that anymore. But I got a new project. Can't get into just yet. But we start shooting that. Um, two weeks, right? Mm-hmm. Two weeks. Um, military related show. Cool right. play. Un- un- unscripted show. It's gonna oh, be right cool. On. Cool. Just educating people on 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 some cool sides of, of the military. Not necessarily soft, but like mm-hmm. all aspects of the military. And right then. Um, yeah, got a uh, transform. Hopefully, after after the writer strike, we can get that into production as well. Wow. Yeah. Outstanding, man. Yeah, man. Um, probably probably a good place, Dan. It's been over three hours. Echo <laughs> Charles, yes, sir. Yeah. Got any questions? Uh, yes, I'm yes. Good. <laughs> be ready, dude. Here it comes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Comes the hard yeah, balls, yeah, bro. Yeah, yeah. When yeah. you when you used to go party in the gas lamp, yeah, yeah. What what year was that about? <sighs> man, two thousand four to. 
Man, I stopped partying in the gas lamp around 2008, so from 2004 to 2008. Okay, so that was my time, too, yeah. by the way. So Were what? you a bouncer at any clubs yeah, yeah. out there? I knew you looked familiar. Yeah. Uh, uh, was there a place uh, on a corner? Uh, yep. uh, <laughs> and there was a girl named, there named, named Sin? <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Sin. yeah, yeah, yeah. There yep. we go. Uh, yeah, it was bitter end. But that's where I knew I saw you. Yes, I, I was like, sir. I knew I knew you from somewhere. Yes, bitter sir. end. Yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Right on. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, we, a, a lot of the team guys would come down because yeah, uh, yeah. two of my friends from Kauai, they'd be, they'd always come okay. down and we'd hang with them. But yeah, that's funny. And you're a bouncer there, right? I was bouncing there yeah. for, like, for a while too, for like at that time. So yeah. since like 2001 to 2007. Okay. Damn, what if I happen to sit? I think she's still. She might have a promotions come out. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. You know, I left that world yeah. a long time ago. But yeah. um, I, from what I see, she's still around. Yeah. They're doing promotions. You know, you know, somebody's out there when they name is Sin. Sin. Like yeah. S-I-N, Sin. She had a tattooed on her back. Damn. Yeah, red. Yeah, Sin. She okay? Asian lady. No, 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 she's cool. Yeah, yeah, she's, she was good. She was good at what yeah. she did. Do you like, think she, she has a she. random, happens to have an Asian name that's Sin, or you think that's a adjustment? Because it is possible. That's a good like, question. Like yeah. sometimes, yeah. you know, people yeah. have a name, it's just yeah. like one syllable. I'm sure it's like short for something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. But she, I know she had S-I-N. Yep. In red tattooed yep. on her back. Yes. I'm a rat. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, and then you said you're negative buoyant. Are you yeah. like big time negative buoyant? Yeah. Like right now, like if you like took a deep breath, you would still sing. I'll still sing. Yeah. 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 Still That's sing. how you know right yeah. there. Because sometimes when you're kind of mm-hmm. in the middle, yeah, yeah, yeah. if you don't have any breath, you just sink. But then if you, you know, you can float if you try to. Where are you at? Same. S- right now, I'm the same, yeah. Like, sink? Like, yeah, yeah. Even with the big the breath? Bottom, even with the big breath. Yeah, no kidding. The other day, but yeah, when I was bigger, when I was like two forty, I could I could float a little bit. Yeah, yeah. got a little got bit of that little. combat swimmer yeah. muscle back swimmer. in the Hell day. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah, but yeah, right on, man. Yeah. Good to meet you in yeah, person. Same right man, on, man. awesome. Yeah, man. we met. I know we met. Yeah, I saw yeah. you when I first saw you on the podcast. I was like, man, I, I know that face, but I'm bad with names. Yeah. I'm good yeah. with faces. Now you remember yeah. he th- he threw yeah. you out the club. Yeah, he probably did. Hey, we can find you. Uh, basically, Instagram, yeah. Twitter, Facebook, Remy Adelaide. Yes, sir. Now, YouTube channel as well. Yes, sir. You got a website that you're going to get developed in yeah, the near yeah, future. Yeah. Remy That's just going to be RemyAdelaide.com. Yes, sir. That's, you got to get that done. Yeah. You yeah. got to make that happen. Follow uh, Jocko's orders. <laughs> <laughs> Remy, man, any closing thoughts from you? No, nah, thank you so much for having me on and allowing me to be a part of this uh epic podcast and uh thank you for you know your service and your leadership man you're always you're always in my head pushing me from the time when we were out in uh nyland and you were getting at us talking about how much more we can go there's always more you know uh, and so I, I i try to follow that um that that pattern in my life so I, I thank you for the inspiration and, and 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 motivation uh that you give me and i know millions of people around the world appreciate you brother and same same echo man, my man. Well, Thanks, man, and uh, obviously thanks for coming. I, I, I sorry this took long. You live in uh, San Diego, that's you know. Good. We'll be able to wrap it up, do it again. Yeah. Um, and so thanks for sharing your lessons learned. Uh, obviously, thanks for your service in the Navy. Thanks for your service in the teams, and thanks for what you're continuing to do today. Thank I mean, you. you're you're putting the word out there. You're setting a great example for people that, like you said, if you work hard, you stay yeah. dedicated, you stay focused. Um, the American dream, Amen. the American dream. Amen. You're living it, man, yes, sir. and you're showing people how to live it. Yes, so, thanks for getting after it, bro. Thank you, brother. Right on. Yes, sir. And with that, Remy Adeleke has left the building and left some positivity. Yep, can definitely change the course of your existence. You can change the course of your life. Hard work, persistence, making some good decisions. Some of those decisions that he made, pretty epic. Yep. Joining the Navy. No no relation to the military. Not even, you know, at one point he talks about in the book, like he's not even down with being in uniform. Hey, yeah. we, I did read that part, yeah. right? Yeah. Doesn't like cops. Does He thinks, you know, military is just cops. More cops. More cops. Yeah, man. I mean, he's got warrants out. He's he's a, a hustler. He's a criminal. Makes the decision. So, get on the path out there, everybody. Help people too. You know, you can spread that word a little bit. You can spread that word a little bit to people. Let them know they got a choice. What's happening? 
They can change the, they can, you can change the direction you're going. Yeah. You can do it. Do you feel like, it felt like he did have tangible seeds of, of like doing the right thing though. Maybe not like super glaring, but <laughs> just the idea. Okay. So he's in the phone, illegal phone mm-hmm. selling mm-hmm. business. Federal and, prison sounded bad. Yeah. Yep. And he was like, hmm. And made the decision just yep. because it's not like, hey, he hit rock wild, you know, and mm-hmm. or, or almost died or got arrested and then changes. He was like, hmm, this is getting a little bit too. Mm-hmm. So yep. let me stop. And then writes a letter. Yep. Look, was it the best move? Maybe, maybe <laughs> yeah. not. But I'm just saying. I can see his 18 year old mind thinking like, yo, I'm covered. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. At least helpful, you yeah. know, yeah. you know, kind of a thing. So it's kind of like mm, the, there was some ingredients in there, mm. which is good. For sure. So, yeah, you add that with a little, you know. And and he liked the movie The Rock. Let's face mm-hmm. it, not the the Navy SEALs in The Rock, and he was right about that. Where they did look freaking badass. Sure, they all got massacred in that one scene. I get it because they had to make the bad guys look extra bad. I get mm-hmm. it, but at the same time, they look badass. So there's, I cannot give that order. You cannot give that order. What are they yelling <laughs> yeah, back and forth? Yeah, that was it. You like, must obey that order. I can't yeah. give that order. Yeah. Give that order. Something like yeah, that. That's exactly what it was. But the part there was a part where probably if we we asked him. Oh, he'd probably be like, oh, yeah, that part was sick, too. Mm-hmm. When he was like, uh, when he asked Nicolas Cage, right? Nicolas Cage was the mm-hmm. scientist guy or whatever. And he had to go with him onto the water. Mm-hmm. And he was like, have you ever been in a combat scenario? And he's like, define combat scenario. And then the, the guy, Michael Bean, who also plays in Terminator 1, by the way, mm-hmm. um, he goes, Shep. And then Shep is like his right-hand man mm-hmm. kind of guy. And he just goes into this thing like, oh, an underwater incursion. Blah, blah, and he goes into this thing real straight face, though, real like almost like it was rehearsed, but just like real um, like regimented mm-hmm. way he said it. But it was freaking sick. And then <laughs> Nicolas Cage kind of listens to it and he goes, in that case, no. And then he goes <laughs> and throws up. It's a freaking funny part. But anyway, that even that part made him look super badass. So, yeah, man, I dig it. Michael Bay, he makes a lot of stuff look badass. Okay. Well, there you go. Make good decisions. Get after it. Get on the path. Hey, if you're on the path, by the way, yep. you need some good fuel. Get yourself some Jocko Fuel. Get yourself some Jocko Fuel energy drinks. Get yourself some protein. You're addicted, yes. I've noticed, yep. to milk protein. Yes, sir. So here, let me tell you what happened today. So I worked out today. Mm-hmm. No big deal. Mm-hmm. But right after I worked out, I was like, okay, you know, let, let me make my way down to record. So what I had was two pieces of chicken, a peach, one milk. Okay. So, you know, some people, they really like to take in the protein, the Mm -hmm. post-workout protein. Right? I'm one of those people. I try to anyway. But think about it. Two pieces of chicken, that was probably like maybe 30 30 grams of protein right there total. Okay. Plus the milk. Okay. 60 grams of protein, just like that. Boom. Super fast. Super good. Oh, yeah. That's a whole, that's a whole, like, that's a whole spectrum yeah. of flavor and taste and satisfaction, yeah, right? A little was, chicken. It's good. Nice. And then you get that milk yep. dessert. Then I had one when I was here, too. Yeah. So think so about it. 90, 90, 90, grams, 90 grams, grams. Without even thinking about without it. Without even no thinking factor. about it. Easy money. Yep. Get some protein. Um, we got powder protein, the pow pow. Yeah. Is pow pow going to catch on as a description? Um, well, I mean, it's 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 stumbling out of the blocks as okay. of right now, but hey, not, you never know. It did, 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 didn't go good out of the box, huh? Yeah, okay, know. powder, <laughs> otherwise known as pow pow. We got everything, so check that out. Jockofuel.com. You can get it at Wawa. You can get it at Vitamin Shop. Vitamin Shop's crushing, by the way. GN number one brand in Vitamin Shop. Did you see that last year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I mean, that's hey. Is that a Nobel Prize? Maybe not, but it shows you. It shows you that people, other people that don't know about it, try it, they keep getting it. That's what the subscriptions do too. The people that subscribe, go to jockofuel.com, you subscribe to Time War, because you're like like me. I'm taking Time War for the rest of my life, because it it has an impact on the way you feel. So check that out. Get it at Wawa. You can get Vitamin Shop. GNC, Military Commissaries, AFES, Hannaford, Dash Stores in Maryland, Wake Firm, ShopRite, HEB. HEB killing it. End caps. You know what an end cap is? Mm, yeah, the, the, the aisle. The, the aisle at the, the aisle. end. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. HEB, they put, they put like end caps because yeah. everybody down in Tejas is rolling in and getting their chocolate fuel hitters. For that chocolate and fuel. then up up in the uh, Midwest, you got Meyer. same thing. Mm. Meyer's 
we I saw I met a bunch with a bunch of the Meyer people. They're they're getting everything. They're bringing it into the stores. Uh, Harris Teeter, Lifetime Fitness, Shields, and then you got like little gyms all over the place. Little CrossFit gyms. We're doing CrossFit. We're doing jujitsu. I happen to have a CrossFit and a jujitsu gym. It's called Victory MMA and Fitness. Guess what we sell here? Jocko Fuel. When you get done rolling. You can get a mulk. Before you roll, you can get a go. Mulk, go. Go, mulk. Either way, you're good to go. If you want to sell this stuff at your gym, email jfsales at jockofuel.com. Get on the path. Get on it. It's called jockofuel.com. It's true. The oh. clean path. Yeah. The goodness. All right, what else? Yep. Origin, USA. American made what? So we started with geese. Yes, we Gies did. Geese made in America. Sure, people thought it was crazy. Mm-hmm. But then when they start rolling out, uh, you know, rolling off the line, mm-hmm. well, no, no, people didn't think it was so crazy. In mm-hmm. fact, it started to become the new standard. Mm-hmm. Since then, American made geese, which have gone through some evolution, by yep. the way. Improvements all the time. So I don't know if you know this about me, but I have one of the original, original origin geese. Mm-hmm. Before before I knew Pete, before I knew no, even okay. of origin, okay. I, it was gifted to me because I did some work um, for this guy, cool okay. guy. It was like fitness dude, and he um, and he was like, "Oh, thank you, whatever." And he gave me that gi. Okay. It was too big for him or whatever, you know. Okay. And um, he gave me that gi, and I was like, "Oh yeah, cool origin gi, right on, cool." Mm-hmm. It was black with a you know gray stripe. It was cool. And then um, so I just put it away, and I didn't train gi that much. And then years later. Mm-hmm. I get the riff gi, I get all these other ones, and then I go back. I'm like, wait a second, that original one I got was a freaking orange, origin gi, and oh. I grabbed it. But you compare the evolution of the yep. the fabric, the material. Yep. So, FYI, the original ones mm. were better than every other gi, mm. but now we're just upping our own game, yes. and we're doing that across the board with everything, with mm-hmm. with the t-shirts we're making, with the jeans, with the everything. <clears throat> we're we're evolving, we're getting better, and we're doing it here in America. Yep. Which is which is what it's all about, right? Because sure, we could be like, oh, we'll make a little T-shirt and we'll make some money off it and have our brand, right? Sure. Cause you can do that. Yeah. You can do that in fifteen minutes. Sure. Set up, set up a, a Shopify drop ship. You know the whole thing, right? Sure. And that's not just look. You're a small company out there. You can make that happen. I get it. That's cool. But then at a certain point, you should say, oh, cool. We're gonna buy American. Or we're gonna sell American. Yep. Not oh, we can save. 30 cents a shirt and yeah. put it in our pockets yeah. as long as we enslave some people overseas mm-hmm. and wreck the environment you can do that I don't recommend it I recommend you go to originusa.com get some American made stuff that's, that's what we're true, doing man. what else uh, also Jocko has a store called Jocko store mm-hmm. aka defcore.com it's all the same jockostore.com defcore.com it's the same gig Check. one and the same Anyway, you were, well, well, hey, on this path, or if you're representing clothing Seems wise, like we should have something else on defcore.com. Like what? I don't know. Maybe just like a black screen that says get some. And anytime you're feeling like what to do in life, you just go there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That could be something. Hey, you, hey, it's not a bad idea. Seems like that would be better use of the URL. You know what that stands for? Yes. What? Uh, wait, no. What is I don't. What does it stand for? Yeah. Um, oh. No, you told know. me this a long time ago. Yeah, it's now like you forgot. Not ring, yeah, I forget. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I know what it is. So there you go. It's the domain name. It's the freaking okay. URL. Anyway, defdoor, <laughs> defcore.com, jockostore.com. Mm-hmm. This is where you can get your shirts and hats and hoodies. You want to represent on the path. Dis, dis, discipline equals freedom. Discipline? <laughs> that too. <laughs> yeah. Represent on the path with discipline equals freedom or good. You know the concept of good? You ever mm. heard of that? Uh, yeah. you, you hear good things? Yeah. Okay. I heard All right. about that one. Yeah, I learned about that one too. But anyway, you want to represent, boom, that's where you can get it. We also have what's called the shirt locker subscription scenario. You get a new shirt, new design every month. Mm-hmm. There you go. Get some of that. Subscribe to it. Subscribe to the podcast. Subscribe to the Unraveling Podcast, the Warrior Kid Podcast, the JockoUnderground.com. Go there. That's our own platform. Look, we don't control the platform. You know, we don't control iTunes. We don't control YouTube. We don't control Spotify. We don't control any of these other platforms. We control jockunderground.com. So we can do whatever we want on there. And that's why we, we do a little, another little kind of adjacent podcast. It's called The Underground. Yep. 
we talk about some other stuff on the underground. Well, we answer a lot of questions on the underground. Oh well, yeah, that's life questions, by yeah. the way. Okay. You when you think about like okay, so every once in a great while we'll get a question that's maybe not quite as impactful, but very interesting. I think like you know, well, there's one that it was asking like what Metallica song you like or something oh, like yeah. that, which yeah. is cool. It's fun. It's yeah. fun. But most of them are impactful stuff. Like, yeah. Hey, you're starting a new job and you don't know, you mm-hmm. don't know what, like, Hey man, am I going to be able to handle this thing? I'm, I'm sketch about it, all this stuff or whatever. Boom. That kind of question. Stuff yep. that's going to like literally help you in life. Yep. Um, no. Well, so there you go. It's $8 and 18 cents a month. And listen, if you can't afford it, it's fine. Just email assistance at jockunderground.com. We'll get you taken care of. But we do need to have something that we own. We need to have ownership of a platform that we can control. Otherwise, it could be a problem. So we, to avoid that problem, we appreciate that support. And to pay for you for the support, that's where we do that little adjacent podcast. Check it out. YouTube, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Subscribe to Psychological Warfare. Go to Flipside Canvas. Get some cool stuff from Dakota Meyer to hang up on your wall. We got a bunch of books. Okay, so from Remy Adeleke, we got Transformed. And then we have Chameleon. Go check out Remy's book. You just heard his story. I mean, it's an incredible story, right? I covered 3% of the story on, on, when I read it. He actually did the audio book. And he does like, you know, he does his little accents and stuff like this. He, 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 he gives some, you know, he, he's an actor. Yeah. And he acts when he's reading it. He yeah. gets into it a little bit. Oh, well, yeah, that helps. You know what I'm saying? It's good. Yeah, yeah it's good. Well, yeah. I listened to the sample. It's pretty good. Yeah. Remy did, did a good job on that. Oh, yeah. Hey, was it on the podcast or was it before we were recording when he was telling about how sometimes he'll be talking to his kid and like go yeah, into yeah. the voice? Was that on the podcast? Yeah. Okay, I couldn't remember if that was before or after. Yeah. Are you sure? I'm pretty sure, yes. Yeah, 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 was. Okay, I, that was pretty yeah, funny. It is fun. Yeah. Bro, I'll do that too. So, What voice do you go into? It's like pigeon. Okay. But Hawaii pigeon. But not when I'm yelling at my kids, but if I get, like, it's been years, mm. but if I start to, like, lose my temper at mm. someone, like, yeah. I remember when I was a bouncer, like, hey, every yeah. once in a while, like, I'd get in a confrontation. Yeah. Uh, get Remy's books, Transformed, and get his new book, Chameleon. Uh, check out Final Spin. I just gave a copy of Final Spin to Remy. He was like, yo, let me read this. I was like, cool, do it. Yeah. So there we go. Uh, leadership strategy and tactics field manual, the code, evaluation protocols, discipline equals freedom field manual. Way of the warrior kid, one, two, three. This is, you know, I couldn't help thinking, right? You give a kid way of the warrior kid, one, two, three, four, five. That's the little, that's the little direction change that they need in their life. I know this because thousands of people have told me that, that those books made a shift in their kid's life or in their life. So help the people around you. Help the kids around you. That's what we're doing. Uh, don't forget about Mike and the Dragons. Don't forget about About Face by Hackworth. I wrote the forward to that. What an honor that was. And then Extreme Ownership, Dichotomy of Leadership. Also, Echelon Front, we have a leadership consultancy. That's what we do. We heard of the talk about JP Dinell today. He's our first uh, instructor that we hired. So we got Leif. We got all kinds of instructors. But what we do is we solve problems through leadership. Go to echelonfront.com if you need help inside your organization with leadership. If you wanna to come to one of our live events, go there and check out events and sign up because we sell out. Dallas is sold out. And that's in September, man, or October. It's in October, mm. it's already sold out. Mm. So check it out, we got FTXs, we got Council, we got Battlefield, we got the Women's Assembly coming up. The, the Chief Operating Officer of Echelon Front, the Chief Operating Officer of Jocko Fuel, and the Chief Operating Officer of Origin USA, they're all gonna be there. So Amanda Roberts is gonna be there, Diane's gonna be there, Jamie's gonna be there. Go and check that out. Uh, Women's Assembly, September 14th through the 16th in Phoenix, Arizona. We also have online training at the Extreme Ownership Academy. This Learn how to live. If you interact with other people, which you do, you're in a leadership position. This is life. Life is leadership. You know how you need to know how to lead. There are skills that you can learn. Go to extremeownership.com and learn some of these incredible skills. And also, if you want to help service members active and retired, you want to help their families, Gold Star families, check out Mark Lee's mom, Mama Lee. She's got a charity organization. And if you want to donate or you want to get involved, Go to americasmightywarriors.org. Also, don't forget about heroesandhorses.org where Micah Fink takes our vets into the wilderness so that they can find 
their soul. Outstanding program. If you want to connect with us on the interwebs, on the gram, on Twitter, on Facebook, boha. Maybe even on threads. You on threads? I'm on threads. Oh, you're on threads. Uh, for Remy, go to at Remy Adeleke. And Echo is at Echo Charles. I'm at Jocko Willing. Just, just, just watch out because there's that force there and you think it's no big deal. It's a sneaky force. Yeah. It's not the kind of force that looks intimidating. Mm-hmm. You actually don't even really know it's there. Next thing you know, you're getting choked out. Yeah, it's true. So watch out for that. It's like a, it's like a 10th planet, planet jujitsu player. Sure. Right? Sure. You're like, oh, this person's skinny. Yeah. Little Eddie Bravo. Well, no, this is no factor. You know, this little guy, it's little true. skinny guy, yeah. you know? And then the next thing you know, you're getting choked. Yep. You don't really detect the threat till it's too late. Yeah. It feels all kind of like limber too, right? Well, so what are you, flexing, flexible? Like, what's that? <laughs> sure. You yeah. know, I'm strong. Yeah. Next thing you know, you're getting your back taken. Next thing you know, getting caught in that uh, rubber guard. Yeah. The rubber guard. That algorithm. That algorithm. That's what it's doing. You don't see it coming. It's true. Kind of like a 10th planet jujitsu player. Just watch out for him, right? Watch out for that. Also, thanks once again to Remy for coming down today. Remy, thanks for your work. Thanks for your service in the teams. And thanks for your service to our great nation. And thanks to all the military people out there who have served and are serving in our military. Thank you for what you do. We get to do what we get to do because you protect our way of life. The freedoms that Remy talked about today, that allow us to have these opportunities, that's because of our military personnel keeping evil at bay, keeping tyranny at bay. And we thank you for protecting our way of life. And also thanks to our police, law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, Border Patrol, Secret Service, all you first responders that are out there on the front lines here at home, protecting us and keeping us safe. Thanks to all of you as well. And to everyone else out there, you know, sometimes it's two steps forward and one steps back, right? You heard that expression before Echo Charles. Sure. Two step forward, one step back. Sometimes it's two steps forward and five steps back. That happens. And boy, does that take the wind out of your sails. And that's probably a person's most vulnerable time. That's when you can rationalize quitting, right? That's when you can say, oh, it's probably not gonna work out. I already gave it my best shot. That's when Remy got sent back to the first day of training after he'd been in basic SEAL training for five weeks and he gets rolled during hell week. That's the time where someone goes, uh, you know, I gave it my best shot. And then he actually gets dropped from training. Dropped, you're done, you're out of here. Go turn in your cool clothes and get your normal Navy outfit back on and go to the regular Navy. Made it through every, made it through hell week, made it through the swims, made it through the runs, made it through all the hypothermia. Then he gets dropped because he didn't perform. What does he do? Humbles himself. Humbles himself as Mark Lee told him to do. Owns his mistakes. And then goes back and does it all again. That's a long journey. That's a hard journey. But guess what? In the end, he made it. And that's what it takes to win. That's what it takes to win. Yeah, you have to work. You have to strive. You have to suffer. You have to humble yourself. You have to own your mistakes. You have to fix them. But most important, you cannot give up. That's the rule. Never quit. And until next time, this is Echo and Jocko out.